Hello and welcome to this event on uh, critical perspectives on the meta science reform movement. And uh, I would like to first welcome you all. And now we hear a little introduction first from Tim Arrington. Great, thank you. Hi, I'm Tim Arrington. I'm the Senior Director of Research at the Center for Open Science. I'm really excited to introduce this symposium, uh, you know, Critical Perspectives on the Meta Science Reform Movement. Uh, we have a great lineup. I'm very excited to hear what everyone has to say, and I'm sure we'll have a rich discussion. Before I pass it back to Seven to get us started to introduce, I just want to say a couple words about this event, why, why it's important, uh, particularly why I think it's important. First is there's a lot of enthusiasm. Um, just listening to the speakers before uh, we got started, I can hear that from them as well to have this event included um, as part of the meta science meetings that have been ongoing. Uh, this has actually been occurring since the very first meeting in 2019. That, that critical perspective was more on replications. Uh, when we had the virtual event in 2021, there's also a, a critical perspective that was included. And I'm excited that we get to do that again today, um, include that uh, perspective uh, alongside the meta science meeting that's occurring. So hopefully this is something that continues. And the reason I want that to continue, and this is the last point I want to emphasize, is this is healthy, right? This is a very healthy thing to have for any discipline and any scholarly work. Um, we want to embrace kind of the self-skepticism enterprise as much as possible. And in many ways, to function well, uh, the most important and valuable insights come at that intersection of differing perspectives. Uh, so with that, uh, welcome everyone to uh, the symposium. I look forward to everyone uh, engaging and hearing from our speakers. Yes, uh, let me just introduce myself. I'm uh, Sven Ulps. I'm a PhD student at the Danish Center for Studies in Research and Research Policy at Aarhus University, and I'll be moderating this symposium. We have six interesting presentations today, and I will shortly introduce every presenter prior to each presentation. And after each presentation, there might be time for one or two short questions and answers to each presenter. And in the end, there will be a 40 minute long Q&A panel discussion with all presenters where you can ask questions addressed to a specific presenter or just post a question to the whole panel. And you can post questions throughout the event in the chat and I will select questions and post them to the presenters. So uh, I guess we can pretty much start with our first presentation, and that is from Bart Penders. Bart is an associate professor at Maastricht University, but currently he's doing a fellowship at the Kete Hamburger College Aachen, Cultures of Change. Bart, the stage is yours. So, um, thank you very much, Sven, for that introduction. It's uh, the uh, Kete Hamburger Kolleg uh, Cultures of Research, not necessarily Cultures of Change, although change is something that we uh, deal with a lot, of course. Um, so, thank you very much for uh, inviting me, for uh, allowing me to speak uh, about uh, some older work as well as some new work. Um, the title that I've chosen, Shamed into Good Science, um, it is, um, well, it's actually uh, the use of the word shame is mostly a signal word. I won't speak about shame too much, um, but actually, um, to me, shame uh, is part of a, a constellation of um, elements of etiquette. Uh, so shame, disgust, guilt, pride, joy, empowerment. We feel all those things. Um, and they guide our actions, they guide our decisions um, and in our daily lives, um, but also in, in our scientific activities. And this etiquette, I will we'll talk about that in a few minutes, um, to me is very much part of a, a civilizing process, um, or at least we can conceptualize um, meta-science even up to a certain point as part of a civilizing process. And if you take a look at the uh, entire list of adjectives um, that the Center for Open Science included in the invitation, um, civilizing is one of them. And it's maybe the kindest one when you talk about critique, um, but it is very substantial uh, thinking about uh, what it means for how we do science and um, how we interpret what we do. Um, so knowing that I would kick off, I, um, I hereby present, um, let's say, an idea of 
a starting point for what um, for meta science um, and scientific reform. Um, the realization that the literature, scientific literature that we know, that it is not actually a collection of true claims, um, that science is not a process optimized to produce those claims, um, and that scientists are not actually incentivized, nor do they virtuously adhere uh, to do the right thing. Uh, this realization that this is the case um, is um, to some common knowledge and to others um, possibly new, uh, or at least at the beginning of the um, meta science movement or reform movement. Uh, and, and it has been described as, um, as a moral panic, or in the words of uh, Peterson and Ponofsky, um, as a scandal, in a sense, um, that the reform movement managed to scandalize the social character of scientific practices. Um, that is not to uh, to be overly critical of that, because if you can manage to scandalize something, you also are able to mobilize a lot of attention uh, and also a lot of resources in order to get something done, um, which um, means that you can try to fix it. Um, and that is, of course, the the uh, objective of meta science to uh, in to create um, the knowledge that then the reform movements can use to reform to change uh, scientific practices, um, and these reformed scientific practices, um, I will argue, um, are actively positioned on a gradient um, from um, regular. Uh, or perhaps primitive um, in incarnations of scientific processes to more advanced um, processes. And of course, everybody wants to be at the advanced end uh, of that. Um, and in order to get there, um, you have to show that um, you are engaging in this more advanced process of doing science. Um, reformed science has to, in some way or another, display its reform in order to distinguish itself from bad science or more primitive science or regular science. Um, and there's a strong moral appeal in that. Um, so the, the, the claim, um, open science is just science done right, um, displays that... Um, what we should be feeling, thinking, or doing is that the the right thing is the reward in itself, um, and um, that means that we have to think about science um, not focused on its outcomes, but focused on its process, um, the how of science, um, not necessarily what it produces. And um, to that end, um, it needs, it requires certain characteristics. Uh, certain characteristics need to be promoted. Uh, transparency, um, obviously, in the context of open science, uh, but also to a certain degree, standardization. If you want to compare um, one experiment with another, um, in the context of a replication, but also beyond that particular context, um, then you need some degree of standardization in addition to the transparency. Um, you need a lot of documentation. Um, and some of that documentation can take the shape of bureaucracy. Um, and uh, Tom will say a lot about bureaucracy and especially sort of how bureaucracy um, is also a type of work. Um, but to me, bureaucracy is, uh, above all else, a type of politics. I'll, I'll get to that. But by doing all of these things, by showing that you participate in a process of science that upholds very specific norms for transparency, commits to standardization, displays all these documents, and uh, sort of lives up to bureaucratic requirements, um, is a way to display that you focus on the process much more than um, than the outcome. Um, and if we conceptualize science primarily as that process, 
um, then what we need, or what we have actually up to a certain point right now, is uh, a series of innovations at our disposal. Um, a series of, of changed um, ways of doing science, changed uh, incarnations sort of of scientific practice, um, populated by different things. Um, and one of those different things uh, is a set of bureaucratic innovations. I just mentioned bureaucracy, but uh, quite important are pre-registration, registered reports, but also very detailed reporting guidelines. Um, forms and templates and formats that are made available for all of those things. So you don't have to reinvent the wheel or come up with what you yourself think might be important to include in those. Um, those forms and templates um, work greatly, of course, also towards standardization. And I've, I've written about bureaucratic innovations before. Um, but what I want to talk about um, today also is social innovations. And actually, whether or not innovation is a good word is, uh, is, is up for discussion. Um, because uh, what we see um, in, in reformed uh, science um, is not just uh, a sort of design of a process to live up to uh, new criteria and, and to use these bureaucratic innovations, but also to self-organize uh, in ways that to some are new, to others maybe not so much. Uh, but we've seen um, the emergence of various collectives and collaborative forms over time, over the last decade or so, um, in order to uphold the very um, uh, norms and values of open and reformed science. And these are um, the many, many labs uh, approaches, uh, big team science uh, approaches, but also adversarial collaborations as ways to, to optimize, in a way, the uh, penetration of these open science values and reformed ideas of what science is supposed to be. Uh, I'll talk today only about the, um, the many labs uh, collectives. But before I do, um, I want to do a really short excursion into a little bit of um, theoretical literature. Um, this is a quote from um, the book, The Process Genre by uh, Skvirsky. Um, and take a look at the, just the, the red little bit, of course, feel free to read everything. But um, what she does in, in her book uh, on the aesthetics of labor, and the book is called The Process Genre, is um, show how um, by our ways of displaying labor and displaying processes, um, we attach certain value systems to them. Um, and um, we evaluate relative to one another different types of processes. Um, and uh, what we have uh, here, or what we can talk about, are developmental trajectories from primitive to advanced. Um, and so in this process genre, um, the advancement from primitive to advanced um, is, um, that's uh, the few, last few words, um, by extension, a statement about the status and character of a people or even civilization. And because this is about distinction and because this is about civilization, um, it means that we have to talk about, um, at least briefly, uh, about some um, sociological theory, um, French and German sociology, uh, that all that we most of us perhaps even know. Um, Bourdieu, Foucault, Elias all uh, talk about how uh, different ways of self-presentation and displays of distinction allow us to set ourselves apart. Um, to show that what we do is uh, different and, of course, better than uh, what others do. Um, and I've chosen to uh, to rely primarily on the work of uh, Norbert Elias, of the uh, German sociological interpretation, um, and conceptualize um, meta-science and scientific reform as a civilizing process, a, a process in which, through 
subsequent and continuous processes of displays of distinction, slowly manners, morals, norms um, shift um, and expectations of what scientists do change. Um, and a lot of that is formal in those bureaucracies that I just mentioned in sort of governance structures of, uh, of collectives. But a lot of it is also informal, just how people work together, how they relate to one another. Um, and these uh, bureaucratic tools fit this notion of civilization, but these collaborative processes too. Um, and for this, for instance, we can think of the uh, possibly famous quote by uh, Kropotkin, um, that competition is the law of the jungle, but cooperation is the law of civilization. So um, to work together um, is the more civilized, the more advanced um, process towards knowledge construction or um, the making of knowledge. So what are those many labs? Um, many of the people in the audience might actually be working in one of these many labs, but others may have never heard of them uh, before. So um, there are many, many labs. Uh, so the original many labs were um, uh, conducted under the auspices of the Center for Open Science, many labs one through five, a series of centrally um, um, governed replication uh, studies in order to assess um, whether or not studies would replicate under certain conditions. Um, and these are, are in the past, um, but they inspired a lot of other people to also organize their way uh, their work in similar ways in, um, and also adopt as a consequence similar labels. So I've showing you here um, not all but many of the many labs out there um, and they cover many topics um, and um, even many disciplines and they are all different and all similar and uh, what i did is um, i interviewed um, and i'm actually still currently interviewing people who are working in these many lab studies, in various roles, leadership roles, uh, data collection roles, um, in order to get to the core of what it means to work in uh, in the context of one of these uh, many lab studies. What's it like to do science that way? Um, and here too, the etiquette of process um, is obvious. And there's a lot of formalization going on um, and a lot of bureaucracy associated with that uh, formalization. So what we see are formal agreements, um, not always, but often between partners, um, to make things clear, what is expected of you um, and why. Um, a lot of manuals, um, some are huge, um, standard operating procedures, videos, um, so videos of a pilot um, experiment, for instance, that is then shared with participants who then send video back of their um, uh, experimental procedures in order to, um, well, on the one hand, convince each other that they are doing things the way they should, um, but also in the context of, of data collection, that video is also data. Um, and um, most of this is very remote. So in some of these uh, collectives, people meet each other, um, but often not. So there are quite a few of these many labs collaborations where people don't meet, uh, or if they meet, it's actually accidental instead of part of their collaborative relationship. Um, and much, much more. So um, what does it mean to formalize collaborative relationships in such a way? What is the, the consequence of, of this type of formalization? So there are many consequences, but one of the things that I'd like to highlight um, is that it, it really does change relationships um, between people. So this is a quote um, by one of the people involved uh, um, or actually working in, in one of the many labs. Um, 
reflecting on the uh, commitments of participants to many labs. Most of the people love working in those many labs and they're having a lot of fun, uh, but a fraction uh, of the people of the authorship, this uh, respondent uh, um, tells me, uh, just respond only to emails critical to their own authorship. Like they don't provide any comments on the draft, they don't seem to care. Uh, and that makes sense. They've done what they've been asked. They've fulfilled the terms of their contract. That is what you get with contracts. This is not exemplary of how people work in many labs uh, situations. Actually, most of the time, people are heavily involved with one another um, and uh, go way uh, far beyond what is expected of them. Um, but formalization allows um, people to, well, stick to the letter of the contract instead of the spirit, uh, which is interesting, of course, um, but luckily, mostly the exception. Um, but what formalization does do is establish power structures, um, quite formal power structures, through the centralization of, uh, of, for instance, the design of research. So if you have a many labs um, collaboration with 300 people in them, they can't all equally, at least not easily, co-design the study, even though they can all participate. Um, but that creates differences between core teams, key teams, leadership uh, roles, and collaborators. Um, and some of those collaborators are, are referred to as collaborators, um, but sometimes also as participants. Um, so that creates uh, a little bit of confusion um, because many of those participants then collect data from participants. Um, but it creates low task uncertainty uh, for some. Uh, another quote by uh, one of the uh, uh, many labs participants is, it's exceptional really. Um, you give me the stimuli and I could just start testing. I felt like a research assistant. Um, it's um, in this particular case, absolutely clear what to do. Um, but power structures always create um, insiders, and outsiders um, in various gradients, of course. Um, and if you have, um, uh, if you use these bureaucratic tools, like, for instance, um, pre registration and registered reports, you have to decide uh, at what point you submit your uh, registered report. And one of the um, uh, many labs. Um, a researcher shared with me that um, that this is also a bureaucratic tool of control. So in a way, um, if you don't have anything like a pre-registration or a registered report, a lot of people will try to, to change something in your design. Um, and I don't think that's a good idea. And when we receive questions like that, we could counter them relatively easily. Um, because we said it's approved like this, we can't actually change it. Uh, so we avoided having many changes along the way. It made it a lot easier because uh, we now know we have to do it this way and we can't change anything. Our initial idea stays our idea. Um, here, pre-registration is used as a tool to exclude certain voices. But you can also flip that out, of course. Um, at the same time, and these are not quotes but paraphrases because I don't have the approved transcripts yet, um, we see people who go above and beyond to get everybody's input and get consensus across all intended collaborators before we move to registered reports. Um, and that uh, can take sometimes years to do um, in order to do it well, but that's an investment that people are willing to do. Uh, or more differentiated, um, we collect views of the underrepresented and freeze those, preventing those with a lot of power to shape it their way. Um, so the decision when to submit uh, a pre-registration or registered report is a decision you have to make. You cannot not choose. Um, but whether you use that to amplify your own voice, democratize the inclusion of voices, or amplify a very specific subset of voices is a um, decision that is 
guided by whatever moral economy you have underpinning the study that you're trying to do. Um, I'm going to skip this one um, because I'm running late uh, already. Um, if you want to know more about this civilizing process, I've, I wrote that down. Um, but the question is that if you continue this process of distinction, where does it end? Um, so a focus on process and the eradication of all sorts of bias from that process means that we have to focus on the weak link. And that weak link is us. Um, we humans are imperfect and that will never change. Um, and if it is us that threatens the integrity of science, um, then it's us who has to go. Um, and that's something that we see throughout the history of science, of course, in the production of this ideal of mechanical objectivity that we also see in the context of meta-science. Um, an ethos of self-annihilation as the price of knowledge. Uh, science as something like death, uh, removing yourself through dying. Um, or very much applied to, to notions of meta-science. Um, a post-human theory of science requiring total transparency and machine intervention. Or, and, and this is from a paper of Sarah Ann, who you will hear in a few minutes, uh, a push towards maximal uh, and mechanical objectivity is reinforced uh, through the infrastructures that, um, that we've set up. Um, so this ideal of post-human epistemology um, frames science not as labor, but as this disembodied process. Um, but these big collectives, these many, many labs, um, they are, if anything, more social um, than, um, than before. And collaboration is, contrary to Kropotkin's quote, not actually the opposite of competition. Uh, big team science or big science in, in general provides structures within which you can compete with one another and structures that compete with one another. And, and from time to time, um, the term frenemies pops up as a description of how scientists operate relative to one another. Big science um, is something that we've been studying for decades. So the, the little book I'm showing here, Little Science, Big Science by uh, the Solar Price, is from the 60s. Um, and since then, we've seen a lot of work on big science. One of the things that's interesting also to highlight very briefly is the imagined cultural power attributed to this approach of science. Um, and that cultural power is a term that uh, Charlie Ebersole actually used on, on his blog. Um, and what it does, it, it sort of produces expectations um, among the people inside the many labs uh, collectors, but also those outside on um, what it can do. Um, and it looks like um, that um, it is acquiring a lot of a lot more authority um, than some people are actually comfortable with. Um, so quite a few people uh, responded similarly um, than the first respondent uh, whose quote is shown here, where um, they expect the many labs to provide the final and definite answer to a scientific question because of the organization of science facilitating that. Um, so kind of answering this question once and for all, we want to have a 100% sure answer. Uh, and the authority of, of these big projects is also a problem if you disagree with them. Um, so one of the people involved says, even though this person is involved uh, in a many labs, if you look at it from the outside, imagine that you disagree. What could you do to actually disagree? Um, Last sentence there, it is just too big, too powerful to actually start to disagree with. Um, it also means that um, if there is so much authority attributed to this way of organizing research, then it might become possible to use it as a tool to adjudicate between 
wrong and right or um, to use it as a policing tool. And one of the um, things that we've seen here is in the context of, of the assessment of the work of Gino, for instance, the label many um, has also been adopted in the context of this many co-authors. So wrapping this up, um, many labs are big science. Um, and big science is managerial, formal, hierarchical, centralized, political, um, but we also know it rather well. Um, a lot of work on big science has been done. Interestingly, the many labs are not yet um, very much driven by central funding, uh, which is, has been one of the main drivers of other older big science initiatives. Um, but in the end, uh, what we're all trying to do here is convince each other of the value of our claims through organizing our work, organizing our labor, um, and the way we communicate. Um, and in many ways, um, scientific reform and the many labs as an example of that are, are performances of, a, of, a, of an imagined civilized process. And that m makes me end with what I should have called this um presentation namely and it's also the paper i'm going to try to write about this um renovating the theory uh, the theater of persuasion thank you mm -hmm. any questions thank you but this was really interesting i personally kind of liked how you started with saying that science is not made for truth claims. And then one of your last slides was where someone said that we want to get truth. That was quite fun. Uh, and now I think that since we don't have any questions in the chat yet, but if anyone has any questions, please put them in the chat. Uh, Nicole has raised her hand and maybe has a question to ask. So I'll open the floor for Nicole. Sure. Thank you, Bart. This was really interesting. And I see why you said over email that we should talk about some of the links between what we're working on. I'm, I'm wondering if you collected any data on people's motivations for joining these projects. And if you think that there's any way of accessing um, information about the so-called non-users here, or people who do not want to join a sort of many labs style project or feel alienated from that style of research. And if we could access those types of people, what would it tell us about the kinds of cultures that are growing up inside of these large collaborative projects? Um, so yes, I have collected data on motivations of people to join. Um, I have asked every respondent um, why they joined and um, for some of them, how they actually, or why they set it up to begin with, if, if they are in this founding role, for instance. Um, but because I'm uh, restricting respondents to people inside uh, these many labs, um, I don't know why people would not want to join them, um, except for reflections of insiders on outsiders. Um, but that is not necessarily actually used for that. Uh, so you'd have to specifically take a look um, at people who do not participate and sometimes actively also critique um, this type of, of organization, you'd probably have to seek them out specifically, just like you'd have to seek out people inside of these collectives equally specifically uh, in order to find out. Uh, but this comparison, of course, makes perfect sense. Um, but I do want to add that um, one of the things that I've learned, um, and I also imagined to be the case, of course, is that the people who work in, in these many labs consortia do not spend all of their time on working in that many labs consortium. They spend a part of their time on doing this type of inquiry, and at the same time also participate in other types of inquiry and actively reflect on the differences between them, sometimes at least, not all the time. Um, and in that sense, there is quite an interesting um, contrast um, to be detected, but in my case, at least, only in the subset uh, of people who already are willing to at least devote a part of their time to this type of inquiry.
Thank you. Uh, Time-wise, I think we have to go on, but I like that there are now a lot of questions coming up in the chat. We will come back to those questions probably in the Q&A at the end of the event. But now we will come to our next presenter, who is uh, Thomas Hostler. Uh, Thomas is a senior lecturer in the Department of Psychology at the Manchester Metropolitan University. Thomas, uh, thanks for joining us. Yeah, thanks for um, inviting me to talk. Um, so, yeah, my talk today is going to be uh, called The Invisible Workload of Open Research. Uh, and it's largely based on uh, a paper I published of the same title um, last uh, last summer. So the, the critical perspective that I'm kind of going to try and bring to this webinar is that a lot of meta-science is too focused on the abstract research process. And that might seem a bit of a strange thing to say because I guess almost by definition, meta science is research on the research process, but it is also an applied field. And most of the time we're doing this research because we want to change the research process. We want to improve it. We want to, um, you know, kind of have a new intervention in it. And so I think we need to think about the context in which these changes happen. And I think typically the context that people adopt is what you might call the research ecosystem context. So in this, um, you know, meta scientists, we're interested in um, the kind of the main individual or the group that we're interested in is the researcher. And the context that they exist in is one of journals and the journal publishing uh, policies um, of funders, of uh, third party kind of tools and infrastructure, things like the uh, open science framework or independent projects like code check. Um, the researcher is embedded in uh, a global scientific community of researchers. And we might kind of even be interested in sort of comparing across national policies and how different uh, countries are, uh, are sort of promoting open science. And I think whilst this is very valuable, there is another context that we can look at, which is the university context. And thinking about it like this, we acknowledge that actually most of the people who are interested in the researchers, they do research, but they also do other things. And typically they're not necessarily just employed as a research assistant, they're employed as an academic by a university. And so the context that the academic exists in is slightly different. Um, we need to think about the services and resources that are provided by the particular university that employs them and that they have access to. We need to think about uh, the managers and the leadership structure in the university that often sets expectations and sets um, policy for, for those academics. We need to think about all the non the work that academics do that isn't research. So teaching, um, grading papers, uh, academic service. We need to think about the colleagues. So not just the academic, the researcher is being part of a global community, but the the colleagues that they interact on on a uh, interact with on a day to day basis. Um, be that fellow academics, but also non academics and support staff. Um, and finally, the local policies that exist for any one individual institution and um, and which can be quite quite varied. Um, and so I think that this perspective has sort of a lot of potential to improve uh, or to contribute to meta science. And there's a, a huge literature already about higher education, which is is not just about education. It's about the kind of academic context. Um, but what I'm going to focus on today is thinking about um, the sort of the non-research work that academics do and how open research impacts on the workload and time that academics have. Um, so this is a very nice uh, infographic that I found that kind of helps to visualize 
what academics spend their time doing. So yes, we, we as meta scientists are, are sort of interested in the research portion of this, um, gathering data, analyzing data, publishing, um, disseminating research. But that's only one portion of, of an academic's time. There's also everything that goes with teaching, um, assessment planning, delivering teachers, uh, teaching sessions, um, training, supervision, and then everything that kind of might broadly fall under academic service. So serving on committees, um, attending career development workshops, organizing conferences, um, things like that. And this way of visualizing it um, is actually very similar to the way that academic work is often conceptualized by the university and the university management. And in fact, it's often formalized uh, in this way through academic workload models. And I'm aware that this kind of differs from country to country, but in general, it's about um, the, the term projectifying time. So kind of allocating the time available to someone into specific different projects. So in the UK and Australia, like I think they're called, they're called workload models. Uh, in the US, I think they're more commonly called uh, like your, your teaching load. Um, and this, uh, this is my workload um, for this year. Um, so it's sort of, this is what the university thinks I do uh, and expects me to do and spend my time doing. And you can actually see from this that actually research is only almost only a fifth of the time that um, I'm kind of employed to, to do that. Uh, the rest of it is teaching, uh, leadership, um, serving on committees, training, things like that. Now, you can see from this that I have, uh, you know, 358 hours per year to allocated to do research, but it's not broken down further than that, right? It's not specified exactly how I should use these hours. So if you kind of agree with the sort of, I think it's quite, it's not necessarily controversial to say that open research generally does take more time than closed research. Um, just something like sharing data, it takes more time to, um, you know, format your data set, put it on a repository uh, than it does to just not do that. Um, then if the new demands to make my research open or the requirements or even just incentives means that it will take me longer to do it, am I going to get more time in my workload to do that? And I can tell you right now, the answer is no, because that would involve basically taking something else away, right? So I can't go to my head of department and say, oh, I'm, you know, I'm going to be doing load more open science now and sharing my data. Um, you know, can you take away some of the essays that I have to mark? Uh, it's just not going to happen. And this idea then that we change the expectations of what a researcher should achieve in a certain period of, of time, um, but without actually giving them sort of more time on a workload is known as um, workload creep. Uh, in, that, in this higher education literature or workload intensification. And so it's basically expecting people to do more, but without giving them more time to do it by taking away other activities. Now, I think that's a sort of useful thing to bear in mind then when we move on to the, my next point, which is that you might say, okay, you know, uh, yeah, okay, open research does take more time, but it, it's not that much, is it? Like if you're pre-registering something, if you're sharing like a data set, quite often it's, you know, it's maybe a 20 minute, half an hour job or something. You know, it's basically just kind of filling out a form and providing some information. Um, and I think that's true. Like I agree, I agree with that. But I think in a way that can make it almost more of a problem than if it was a huge investment in uh, a new activity. And a lot of open research practices or interventions through from journals and funders or, or other actors to increase the uptake of open research, thinking about them as basically minor administrative tasks 
is also quite a useful perspective. Um, and to be honest, I think that as much as we as meta scientists can kind of wax lyrical about pre-registration as this amazing tool to reduce bias and you know prevent p-hacking, there are going to be a lot of researchers out there who look at a pre-registration document like this and go, oh, great, like another form that I need to fill out before I can actually start doing my research. So this might apply to things like pre-registration, uh, data availability statements, transparency statements, transparency checklists, uh, author contribution statements, metadata descriptions. It is essentially admin. It's it's filling out a form and providing information that records what you are doing. So what is the issue with that? If it does only take 20 minutes, like why is that a big problem? And as I said a second ago, I think it's because it's a cumulative problem and that the existing administrative burden is quite high for a lot of researchers. So this is only my personal example, but if I want to do uh, a piece of research at my university, then I'm looking at probably filling out a 16-page um, uh, ethics form application, um, another 12-page research protocol document, to upload as part of that, a uh, 10-page data management plan. Uh, if I'm collecting sort of sensitive data, then probably another 14-page uh, data protection impact assessment, um, maybe another uh, six-page uh, information security assessment um, if it's particularly sensitive data. If I want to do any research involving the UK National Health Service, the military, prisons, police, uh, I'm looking at at least double that because they're all going to have their own ethics uh, processes to go through as well. And there's not a huge amount of research on this already, but a, a study from 2009 that looked at uh, the time that um, investigators spent on uh, funded grants found that they estimated about 42% of an investigator's time was actually spent on the administration uh, of a project rather than doing the actual research as in collecting and analyzing the data. Um, and this is worth bearing in mind when we kind of return to the idea that even that is only one part of an academic's job. And so the administration that is associated with research and the new administration that's associated with open research Maybe that does only take 10 minutes, but across all of these aspects of academic work, there is administration, and typically it's increasing as people introduce new initiatives and um, ways to improve it. So we're in a webinar right now about meta science. Possibly somewhere else on the internet, there is a webinar of you know research safety uh, officers debating a new health and safety procedure that is going to improve the safety of research. And that's going to involve filling out another better improved form that takes about 10 minutes. Um, maybe there's another conference going on about pedagogy and teaching that involves another new intervention there where maybe that takes, you know, about 10 minutes. So across this whole, uh, sort of diagram of, of academic work, there is administration everywhere and it's always increasing. So although any one individual instance of an open research practice or administration, you know, it can just be dismissed as trivial. Like 10 minutes is, is a trivial amount of time to complain about. You can't even really formulate a, an argument against it. But it's not just the one piece. It's the cumulative burden of all of these that has been described as um you know, it's death by a thousand 10 minute tasks. Um, so thinking about um, open research as a type of administration is really useful because there are already a lot of literature and theories out there about administration and administrative burden and how we can decrease it. Um, so I'm going to share with you three ideas from that, that that can be helpful in thinking about this. So the first is the distinction between administrative uh, sort of justified burden and administration and red tape. And this distinction is that if you has a if it has a benefit, 
then it can be justified. But if it entails a burden, but it doesn't actually make a contribution to achieving a rule's functional objectives, then you can think about it as red tape. And one example of this um, is something like on an ethics form, uh, the ethics application that is goes across my whole university has questions like this on it that says, does the project involve ionizing radiation? Does the project involve lasers? Now, 99.9% .9 of researchers in the university, the answer is going to be no, because, you know, historians and people working in the English literature department are just not going to do a project that involves radiation and lasers. Um, even people like myself in psychology, like I don't do research that involves that. So asking every single person who's doing an ethics application, whether their research involves lasers is not actually for most people fulfilling the objective of trying to protect participants because it, they would never even get to the stage of being able to use that. Another idea that I really like is about rule redundancy, and this is the overlap of administration from different organizations, um, which creates this, again, unnecessary burden. So if you think of something like a data availability statement, this might be something that you need to provide in a grant application, uh, on an ethics form application, uh, to your university sort of research services, if you're hosting the data um, with them, uh, for a data repository uh, and for a journal. You, could, you can almost guarantee that although they re all require the same information, the exact form that it comes in is going to be different. So maybe the word count or the word limit for this is different. Or just the specific way they ask the question means that when you are copying and pasting it from all these different uh, organizations, you're having to sort of adapt it slightly to fit the question that is being asked. So that is, again, kind of unnecessary time cost of having to duplicate it, but change it every time. The third um, idea, which has kind of got a quite retro sounding name of robotic bureaucracy, um, I think it was a theory sort of developed, you know, about 20 years ago or something, um, is that often we think, well, okay, well, we can, you know, automate a lot of this administration. Uh, and, and that is going to reduce the burden. But this would say that, okay, in theory that works, but it can actually inadvertently end up increasing it because the forms are difficult to understand, they're misinterpreted, and then you actually need to kind of contact someone and, and go back and forth through it and sort of explain why it's not relevant to you. And this is a particular issue when we think about... Um, well, particularly relevant to a lot of research done in the humanities, because a lot of existing research administration, like ethics applications, often by default kind of assume that your piece of research is like a biomedical clinical trial. And they're asking you about uh, what's your hypothesis? How are you going to collect informed consent? But a lot of research, those kind of concepts aren't relevant. Um, so I think Nicole is later is going to be talking about autoethnography and, and the idea of consent in ethnography is a lot very different to like if you're signing up for a drug trial. And so if we have something like the, the level three top guidelines for journals, which say, um, you know, you must post your code to a repository and it needs to be independently reproduced prior to publication. You need to pre-register your study. Um, you know, a lot of research people are going to be going like, well, that's not relevant to me. So I either have to, you know, sort of ex like explain that to the person doing it or write some statement that explains why it's not necessary. And again, that is in terms of fulfilling a functional objective, there's not really doing much. Um, and the sort of final example here before I wrap up is that I've talked about um, examples where it's sort of new bureaucracy created by open research but the f open research um can indirectly in sort of make existing administration more burdensome as well so if you think that conducting research openly tends to facilitate uh, big team science projects uh, like bart talked about before um this is one that from the psychological science accelerator 
uh, had something like 500 authors on. Um, and I can't rem remember where I heard this, but um, they said that when they submitted one of these to a journal, uh, they got to the sort of, you know, journal submission page and they had to add the authors in and, and they sent an email to the, to the editor saying like, Oh, you know, we've, we've got all this information in a spreadsheet. Can we just send you that? And they were like, no, this is the only way that we accept submissions. And so they, someone had to spend nearly two days manually entering every single author one by one into the manuscript submission portal, um, which is obviously, you know, an unnecessary administrative burden. So I'm going to wrap up with three um, implications and solutions then. So from thinking about the time cost of administrative research, um, sorry, the time cost of open research and thinking about it as a type of administration. And I think the first implication is that we do need to think more about the time costs associated with open research practices. Every, all open research is associated with a time cost, even if that is minor compared to not doing it. And we need kind of more discussion around whether these costs are justified. Are our initiatives fulfilling their functional objectives? Even something like pre-registration, where the objective is to reduce bias in the research, it's not fulfilling getting everyone to pre-register their research. It's not going to fulfill that if actually no one is reading these pre-registrations or checking whether they've been followed. It's not easy to design uh, administration that is not a burden because both overly standardizing a form creates problems, but equally having a hundred different forms for a hundred different kinds of research is a burden as well. Um, but I think, you know, one thing that we're probably not doing enough is just getting feedback from users about their use of these, these practices and these um, forms to see whether they do meet their requirements for their areas of research. So the administration of open data is going to look very different from for an ancient historian compared to an astrophysicist. Um, so, you know, should we be getting them to use the same form? The second is building on that idea of rule redundancy and how we can reduce that. Um, can we work together to collect and standardize information? Uh, one idea that I really like that I've, I've kind of not seen take off as much as I thought it would is the registered reports funding partnerships, where you basically, uh, it's a registered report, but you apply for the money to do the project at the same time. So it's like a, a grant application and a journal submission in one to reduce that uh, overlap of the, the bureaucracies. Um, and even little things like reducing formatting requirements, accepting format-free information. You know, this is something that a lot of journals are doing now, which does, you know, is a godsend when you've been rejected from one journal and you want to send it to another. You don't have to spend a lot of time reformatting it. And although it is quite cliche to say like, oh, maybe AI could solve this, um, you know, that is actually something that it is quite good at, uh, giving it a load of text and saying, can you rewrite this under the following headings? Um, so maybe there's potential for that to sort of reduce this as well. And then finally then, um, you know, I think going back to the, the title of the talk about invisible workload, I think we need to see that open research takes time. We need to change research culture to account for the time that it takes. Uh, we need to make sure it is seen in workload models uh, and accounted for in the metrics and the expectations that we re assess researchers on. We need to make sure that uh, job roles and responsibilities are formally recognized the work that goes with open research. Uh, so this is particularly for kind of, uh, you know, non-academic support staff who may have previously kind of been a technician, but now suddenly they're expected to help with making data open, uh, you know, making sure that's recognized in their job roles uh, and kind of formalizing those careers a bit. Uh, and setting expectations for students and ECRs about the demands of open research. Um, and overall, you know, final point is to, to kind of not promote open research uncritically. Uh, you know, it does take more time. And if you think about academic work more holistically, you kind of quickly come to realize that time is an academic's most valuable resource. Um, so I've gone a little bit over, so apologies for that, but thank you very much.
Yes, thank you, Thomas. I think we might have time for one quick question. So I think an interesting question also, because you uh, hinted towards this in the end of your presentation, is uh, how can we understand and reconcile misalignment of functional objectives of researchers, employers, e.g. universities, versus those of employers like customers, like funding agencies? Yeah, I mean, good question. I think... Um... I, th I think that that is already there is more uh, connections between universities and funders. Um, so my university, at least, you know, they, we have a whole department of people who will help you write your research grants, help you choose a funder who who fits your area of it, uh, and I believe that they are in like quite close contact with funders and kind of feeding back towards each other. So I think there is potential for those links to become stronger. And that might involve, you know, things like building in, um, you know, ethics applications with grant applications. So again, if you can kind of do those at the same time, your university approves your ethics for a project that you want to do at the same time as it approves your funding application to this agency, because you're going to have to do it anyway, right? You're going to have to get ethical approval at some point if it gets funded, then sort of bundling those together can help um, reduce that bureaucracy. Yeah, thank you. That was uh, very interesting. Now, uh, after the next presentation, we will have a five-minute break. And uh, before we will have one more presentation, which is from going to be from Stefan Guttinger. Stefan is lecturer for philosophy of data uh, and data ethics in the Department of Sociology, Philosophy and Anthropology at the University of Essex. Great, thank you. Tom, could you maybe stop sharing your screen so I can share my... Sorry, thank you. Uh, let me just share this. Um, so just whilst I'm sharing here, I'm... Um... Thanks to Sven and everyone who was involved in setting this up, and thanks for having me. Um, I really appreciate that. Um, I'm also, I realized when I looked at the abstracts that I'm, I'm quite um, the old one out because I don't really talk about the reform movement necessarily, but I do hope it's interesting and I do think it's it should be relevant. Um, so, as you can see from the title, I want to talk about why I think replication is underrated and by that, I mean that also the people who are really rating replication, for instance, people, certain people in meta science or in the reform movement are actually not rating it enough. So that's kind of where I want to go. And um, the title is, for those who know, the paper is a, is a play on a paper by Uliana Feist, um, who's actually in the room. So hi, Uliana, I can't see you, but I'm good to have you here. And so her paper is why replication is overrated. And one of the claims she makes is that um, replications are less useful and important than is widely assumed, at least in the kind of psychological research I have focused on in, in that article. And to confuse everyone, I'm going to say that I actually fully agree with what Uliana is writing in that paper, and I, th I think actually can be expanded. It's not just psychological research, the kind of uncertainty uncertainties that she highlights. I think they also apply to molecular cell biology and other fields. Um, and so, yeah, I'm at the point where I'm saying basically um, replication is overrated and replication is underrated. So the question is obviously how how are you going to, like, how do you pull this off? And the point is obviously that I'm, how I split what I mean by replication. And that's really where I want to go. So the move I want to make here is that I want to say that replication understood as dedicated replication studies is overrated in the sense in which Uliana, for instance, describes it. So we should still rate it, but not overrate it. So it's not like a fool, it's useless or anything, but just we should not overrate it. And then the other point is that replication as what I will describe here as inbuilt replication samples is actually underrated. And so the two things I need to do, obviously, here is I need to first explain what I mean by this distinction, dedicated versus inbuilt. And then from that, I need to um, explain or de develop what I mean by underrated in what sense and why. So that's what I'm going to do. Um, so for the first step, this, this distinction here, 
Um, the first part of it, like the dedicated replication study, that's kind of just what we usually experience or encounter when we talk about replication, especially also in, in meta science or the reform movement. This is a an experiment that is a dedicated replication. It's set up as a self-contained experiment or a larger project, depending on um, how it's structured. And it's not part of the everyday research process, right? It's like um, Bart said that people don't just work on many labs. They do other things as well. They have their own research strength going. Yeah, so that's a methodological point. And, you know, these are like the studies that we know um, and many more, obviously. And they can also be smaller scale and are not published, but it's kind of a dedicated, self-contained thing on the side almost. Obviously related to your interest, maybe, but still. Um, then there's a quantitative point. Um, it's you, the observation that always comes up. We rarely perform um, replication studies, dedicated replication studies. And now this is obviously what is being pushed for as part of this kind of replication crisis narrative and the activism that it generated. And then kind of the, the goal of these types of replications, that that's something that the authors listed here have highlighted, that this kind of a diagnostic aim. Yeah, so there's an epistemic point in there. We want to say something about that, um, about those um, studies that are being replicated, so the previously published results. Um, just quickly on this, um, this slide, you, you can disagree with that in different ways. I know that like distinctions between direct and conceptual replications are not that popular anymore. I think they work for certain purposes. I'll, I'll keep to that more or less for now. But if we think of roughly what many people describe as direct replications, you know, we see different things they can do. They can at least help to detect fraud or kind of questionable practices. And they can increase, help us increase trust in the reliability of these previously established results. So they just once we can replicate the result, for instance, we can reduce the likelihood of a, a chance result due to sampling error or there was a fault instrument, an experiment to mistake and so on. And then people often highlight like all the things they, they cannot do. So they cannot check for systematic error because they kind of the idea is to use the same setup. So if there's an inherent flaw in there, you, you will reproduce the artifact. So you can just say you've got a robust artifact. Um, you cannot necessarily test generalizability, um, even though you're always, as Nozick and Arrington highlight, you always generalize because you, you do it again in a slightly different context and so on. But it's kind of you, you're not using a different population, for instance, or you're not extending it to different materials because you try to do the experiment with the same materials. And also this kind of idea of robustness like you cannot re-establish the robustness of your result because to many people that means you would have to show kind of the same result using different methods or different oper operationalizations. So it can do some things, it can't do others. So they cannot do everything, but who can? So they still do necessary work. So they should be rated, but not overrated maybe. So yeah, that's where we are with these dedicated replication studies. The other side of that distinction that I want to make here are these what I call inbuilt replication samples. And so what I mean here is that this is a replication that is part of the everyday research process. It's really integrated into the experiment that you are performing as one sample among many others in that experiment. So again, that's the methodological point, how, it, how it's done, where it fits in into your research practice process. For the quantitative point, I would argue that is an abundant form of replication. Um, Peterson and Panofsky in their paper where they interviewed um, scientists, they, they come to the same kind of, they, they have this claim as well. And here, um, these types of replications can have, for instance, also an integrative aim. And that's kind of, you try to build on previous work. You try to integrate work that is happening. It's not necessarily just diagnostic. They can have a diagnostic element to it, but that's not necessarily the main aim or the, the motive for why this is being done, as Peterson and Pan Panofsky put it. Um, just quickly, that's actually, a, you know, we can trace this kind of idea of these in intrinsic kind of replications back to quite some time. So here's Hunt from like 50 years ago says replicating is an intrinsic part of science and not something which is missing unless someone deliberately sets out to replicate. 
which is what I would call kind of a, you know, set up a dedicated replication study. Um, Schmidt in 2000, in his kind of well-known 2009 paper, he writes at the end, in a follow-up study, parts of an earlier study are directly replicated within that new study, but then there is either a second condition within this experiment or a second experiment that assesses a new hypothesis that was not, not tested before. So kind of building on this um, previous work. And Stuart Feierstein also says, experiments get replicated because people from other labs use the published results and the methods in their own experiments. So again, this is kind of built in replication that happens. And so this is really kind of this integrative mode or the motive is integrative. It's like you replicate it because you want to build on, on these existing findings. Okay, and I, I wrote about this um, in a previous paper um, where I looked at the experimental life sciences. And here I said that um, basically all, almost all experiments in biology contain such an inbuilt replication, which is often quite direct in the form of the humble positive control sample. So it's one sample among many. And back then I called these micro replications because they don't necessarily um, replicate the whole previous experiment, but only the bits that are relevant to that particular um, experiment. And I think this matters for the quantitative point because I do think dedicated replication studies are very rare, but these built-in replication samples are highly abundant. And that's something that also Peterson and Panofsky observed in their interviews. So there's actually there's actually much more replication work happening than we usually kind of talk about or recognize, right? So that addresses the um, the quantitative point. I just want to give a quick example of of, of what that might look like. So this is a, a random study I picked um, just on Google Scholar and just open and checked who has a who has a positive control. Some papers don't use positive controls, which I think is problematic. And anyway, we can discuss that later. But here's a study just for Arabidopsis plant biology. Details don't really matter, but it's more this is figure one. So it's kind of the opening figure of the paper. And here they characterize their model system right there, their experimental setup. And so here WT means their wild type. And then this here is a mutation, a mutated gene that they introduced. And then over here, if you can see, hopefully my cursor um, is like the rescue phenotype. And so this is repeated here. You can just see if they mutate this protein or the gene CTL1 and it doesn't function, the plants are smaller, they don't grow as tall. And over here, you can see that the root structure is very short. So why do they go through this? Well, if you look at the text, they say, well, we examined the phenotype of this mutation in detail, blah, blah, blah. We found they're smaller and so on. And then it comes here, and this is consistent with the previous observations. And if you go to this paper labeled number 15, you find a study that has reported for the first time, if you mutate this protein, you find these phenot this, this kind of, you find this type of, of, of effect. And so you will not find, if you Google this or Google Scholar this, you will not find like a replication study of the CTL1 phenotype mutation, but it has been replicated just in the form of this kind of integrated positive control. And somebody has actually directly replicated this particular experiment. And so that doesn't get like published in that sense. So if you Google titles and abstracts for replication studies, you will find nil, there's just zero, but actually they all happen. So it's a, it's also a measurement problem, I guess, for, for meta science. Where do you look to find replications? So that's just one example. Um, I, I could bring up others sometimes. Anyway, the point here is I think introducing this distinction between these kind of dedicated replication studies and these replications that happen as part of everyday research practice does not change, not only change our quantitative claims, how much is there is out there and how we measure it, but also claims about the function of replication practice. And if we go back to the dedicated replication studies and this arguably flawed, but hopefully informative slide, you can see what I highlighted here that the main work that is being done is that trust in the reliability or stability or some call talk about truth of previously established results. That's that's what it works towards. Um, and that's a backward looking function. You generate new data to diagnose the previously the existing data, right? It looks backwards. 
And I think that also includes what Peterson and Panofsky um, describe as the integrative mode, because in the integrative mode or with that motive in mind, when you replicate, you're trying to establish, does that does that bit of existing literature work for me? Can I build on this? Can I extend on this? Or should I ditch this and choose something else and so on? So it's kind of this, do I integrate this with my own work? It's kind of in a, in a way it's backward looking still. What I want to highlight here is that these inbuilt replication samples, this kind of integrative mode of, of, of replication, does not just simply um, corroborate existing results, either for diagnostic or integrative purposes, but it's central to increasing the trust in the new data that is being generated. Because as we know, a positive control is really kind of about, is this experimental setup that I have working as it should? Oh yes, it, you know it, this is the, the, the proof of principle sample in a sense. Yes, it works. It shows what others have seen. I can trust the way I have set it up. And so, the data that I generalize that I generate with it, the new data, we have a higher, you know, the, we're more likely to trust it as like, okay, yeah, they have a working system. And so I think that's also really important for how researchers read papers and data. So they're not like sometimes, and Peterson and Panofsky also say that like replication starts with trust, or at least in the integrative mode. Well, where does that trust come from? I think it comes from reading these kind of these built-in samples of replication, the way controls are integrated, how they work within the experiment and across experiments. And so this is like this whole web of trust establishing practices that are being performed. And so that really gives replication this forward-looking role. It's a really, I think it's a really important epistemic role that is overlooked. And that's why I think replication is underrated in the current debate, because we're not taking into account this particular forward-looking role. And so that's all I have to say. Basically, I repeat my key claims. Replication as a dedicated study has a backward-looking function. It assesses strength, reliability, truth, or whatever of existing results. A replication as an inbuilt replication sample, or however you want to, whatever terminology you want to use, has a forward-looking function. It can tell researchers about how much trust to put in newly generated data. So it works both ways. I think the exclusive focus that is very dominant in the debate about replication crisis, about how to improve science, the exclusive, exclusive focus on these dedicated studies means that an important aspect of or an important functional role of replication work is overlooked. And so, um, yes, it's generally underrated in contemporary debate. That's all I want to say. And I hope I'm on the time. I think I am. Great. Um, thanks for your attention. I'm going to stop sharing. Thank you, Stefan. That was uh, really interesting. And uh, now we have 12 minutes time for questions. So if you have questions, just put them in the chat or the Q&A. Now I also found that one. <clears throat> it's when you're the one person be between the break and um <laughs> and yeah Yeah, we have one question is uh, what happens in forward looking replication when a lab attempts to replicate the results in order to build on them is unable to and they move on to another question. Um, so they want to build on something they try to replicate it, um, it doesn't work, I think. I think it depends a bit on how central that particular piece of, of information is to their work and plans in what stage they are. Um, because if they, if it's really central to, let's say it's a description of a particular gene sequence and they want to work with mutations, they want to study, okay, if we delete this particular area of the gene, does it then not do what was reported, but they can't even actually reproduce the, the wild type activity of that protein, for instance, which would have to be their positive control to say, okay, this is the level of activity we see. Then we do this mutation and, you know, activity goes down or up. 
Um, so if they can't even then reproduce that, I mean, they would that that would trigger um, a very that would trigger them to investigate and just the things we do when stuff doesn't work and talk to the other to the, those who published it and exchange materials and just figuring out who is going wrong and where the whole messiness of failed replications. Um, in other bits, I guess if the kind of this, you know, if it fails and well, then you might just drop it and you don't work on that. So I think if your positive controls fail, you you just go into a very deep mode of of not trusting your system at first or not trusting the new result. It depends a bit on what you use at your positive control as well, I would say. If it's like a brand new result, you're probably less kind of trusty. If it's something that you've known has been used and kind of reported many, many times over, you will not trust your PhD student or whoever does the work. So I hope that answers the question a bit, but I'm not sure. Let's go to the uh, next question. Here's one uh, that asks, what about differences between different cultures of research and their forms of doing replication? Yeah, very good point. Um, I don't really touch on that. Um, my, my focus is firmly, actually, I probably had like disclaimers somewhere. Like my, my focus and my thinking in this part comes firmly out of um, kind of experimental life sciences, biochemistry, molecular biology. You see this with the examples that I'm using, like plant biology, but kind of genetic work. Um, I'm not, so I, I, I originally I trained in biochemistry, so that's kind of the area I know. I've never done a research in psychology. I do assume they use kind of, they have a, a culture of positive control as well, but I wouldn't know. So I would restrict my claim to these kind of experimental life sciences and leave it to future investigation, how that actually plays out in other fields. Um, I would also not say that this for, because I do think that replication work should always be thought of in a very localist manner. There are just certain ways where, um, certain areas of practice, of research practice where how you control doesn't really works differently so i wouldn't want to make universalist claims what i do think is universal is like this repertoire of trust establishing practices and that's something i think we should focus on much more in our thinking about science is kind of how how do these work these have this can be communication between people it can be specific tools we implement in the experimental setup but again it's kind of where should we um, put the focus and Personally, I think the moves towards, for instance, automation that are happening, they might disrupt these networks of trust establishing practices for better or worse. But I do think it's that's kind of the level where I want to think in a more universalist manner with this particular bit. I would say, yes, experimental life sciences, other cultures, let's do more research. Yes, uh, uh, another interesting question, I think, is uh, can you understand dedicated replication as forward looking as well? Uh, it, mm -hmm. it tells you how much trust you should have on the finding that is being replicated. The distinction between forward and backward looking doesn't seem significant to me. Old claim. Okay, yeah. Um, yeah, um, I do think. I'm, I'm struggling with the forward backward looking um it's i i do and it is um the limitations of words i haven't come up with a better way of of trying to capture what i'm thinking of of course in a way research always moves forward and doing a dedicated replication studies kind of you know looking at previously published results is an important element of looking forward and of can we trust this and then it's it's a yeah it's a good point um i wouldn't say it's irrelevant as i think it's just it's it's just bad choice of words maybe or like just not optimized yet um there is just something about there's like a there is an element of there's there's an element of replication of kind of let's examine and let's build trust in the things we already have, whereas the moment, the motive or the mode that I want to emphasize is replication as a tool to build trust in the newly generated data. So I think in the Nozick and Eric 2020 paper, there's like the generating new data to diagnose the existing results. And I think this just, it, it works 
the other way as well. Existing results help us generate trust in newly emerging data. So that's kind of the, the dynamics that I want to emphasize. But yeah, I give you the point. It's forward, backward looking. Everything moves forward, maybe. Thank everyone. Yeah. Our next presentation is going to be from Saren Field. Saren is Assistant Professor in the Department of Pedagogy at the University of Groning, uh, Groningen. And please go ahead. Thank you. Can everyone hear me? Yes, great. Right, my screen. Thanks for having me. I'm, uh, I'm most happy to, to be here. Um, it's a pleasure to be able to share a platform with with people like this and I, I always enjoy having a chat about meta science stuff now that always makes me happy um, so I'm talking a little bit about the idea of a community of practice and the conceptualization of um, this within the science reform movement so I have been only ever been a meta scientist I never had one of these original research areas and moved into meta science later on in life or anything like that. I, I started in meta science in 2013. And so I've seen the, the movement, uh, if we can call it that, community uh, groups evolve and develop as, as time has gone by. And my own perception of what's going on and my own approach has also become more and more nuanced and has developed over time too. And part of what I'm talking about today kind of reflects that a little bit. Um, I'll just move these faces away. So, so often in, in the literature you read about uh, the science reform movement or the open science movement as if it's a monolith, as if it's this, this homogeneous thing. Um, and certainly we can think about this as, as science reform, as being a single community of practice. Now, a uh, community of practice is... Kind of what it says on the tin, it's a community of people that is drawn together based on practice, a, a joint interest or a joint enterprise. And so in that, in that sense, you know, science reform has got a joint enterprise. The joint enterprise is science reform or improving how we approach science practice. There's a shared repertoire, shared discourse. Obviously, we, we talk about things like replication and registered reports as though they're the most obvious concepts in the world but if you step outside into industry for example a lot of people won't know what the heck you're talking about but we we share this these discourses these um, debates discussions uh, we share practices a lot of us share data if we're in fields that, that that's appropriate for for example a lot of us use registration registered reports um, and we see that we we reify our values so our values you know as a as a group as a, a community, tend to revolve around doing better science, so more transparent science, more reproducible science, for example, uh, more valid science. And so we see reifications of, this, of these values in the fact that we generate practices that support these, uh, these values in terms of research practice. Um, so I did an ethnography in my PhD uh, because I was kind of just interested in studying the reform movement uh, from an ethnographic perspective. It took place over four years. I'm sorry about how wordy some of these slides are. It always looks worse when I see it in practice. Um, but it involved a virtual ethnography. So I kind of started my PhD uh, at the precipice of the, of the pandemic. Um, and so it very quickly went from in-person in field work uh, to Twitter work, online work, which was interesting. Uh, and as a result, you know, the question for me was really uh, revolving around, you know, who's the community of people I'm, I'm talking about? Is it a community? Where's the field in which I'm working as an ethnographer? Um, I ended up settling on sort of being interested in just the people who talk about science reform, the people who practice science reform stuff, the people who post information and, and events relating to science reform, open science, reproducible science, that kind of thing. And so I conducted a, a virtual ethnography on Twitter um, on the community of people who, who appeared at the time on Twitter. And I used the theory of the community of practice as an analysis tool, as a way of sort of framing and legitimizing some of my, my observations. And I saw a couple of different things that I thought were interesting. For one thing, membership. 
uh, in the group is continually negotiated. So what makes you an open scientist? We see discussions about, you know, well, if you don't share all your stuff, then you're not an open scientist or if people don't tend to say it that bluntly. But often there's that assumption that if you don't, you know, take everything from the buffet, then then you're you're not the real deal. Um, but, you know, what what makes you a science reformer? What makes you an open scientist? These were things that were discussed. Um, like I said before, you know, we see forms of reification of the, these values, you know, um, we see people really centering pre-registration and registered reports and that kind of thing. Um, replication, as this symposium, for example, shows, um, these are forms of reification that explicitly and implicitly focus on certain uh, traditions in research. For example, the positivist traditions uh, tend to be spotlighted and focused on a little bit more than, than other traditions, for example. So these these reflected values are interesting to kind of observe. Um, and we see central versus more peripheral agents. Obviously, for example, the Centre of Open Science, um, Brian Nozick associated with that. You know, we see those as being quite central figures, uh, entities within the group. But there are, of course, more peripheral people, people who are just kind of, you know, interested on a, but on a peripheral level, they don't need to go all, to all the things and do all the, the open science stuff to, to be interested in the discourse. And so that, that was some of my observations that I made during this ethnography that I think are interesting. And to a large extent, uh, my research supported the idea of a single community of practice. Let me just check my time. I don't want to run over. Um, yeah, the, the concept of a single community of practice was to some extent supported. Um, but at the same time, it was a little bit less homogeneous than I'd expected as well. There was variability and diversity and some interesting factions and cracks in the, in the landscape of the research reform or science reform movement that I, that I saw. And so I thought, okay, um, you know, I'm interested in the structure of this group. So what might a network analysis suggest? So I straight stood up through the, the API, which used to be, um, open to, to researchers back in the day, um, using keywords like open science, open research, reproducibility in their bios. Now, obviously, this is not a perfect proxy, um, but it, it is, you know, to some degree a way that we can sort of get a sense of who self-identifies with this movement. Um, I looked at these people and the connections between these people. Uh, to create a graph of, of just over 2,000 nodes or 2,000 user accounts. And this is what I found, find. This is, uh, in technical terms, a hairball. And uh, it's a whole mess of people. Now, the nodes in the middle that are a little bit bigger and a little bit paler, they're especially central nodes, meaning they have a lot of connections. But um, to a large degree, there's a lot of peripheral plays and a lot of people who sort of are involved, but not to a very central degree. And I've listed some of these uh, usernames next to these nodes too, which is just interesting. Um, so I, I noticed that um, the density, for example, it was, it was not a very dense network. I expected it to be a little bit more dense. Um, and yet only 2% of possible connections had actually been made within the corpus. So that's not a very dense corpus. Despite this, though, about half the users in the graph are mutual. They, are, they follow each other, which is interesting. This tends to indicate a somewhat flattened hierarchy within a community. Um, and so this high degree of reciprocity was kind of interesting. And I wasn't sure how to sort of interpret that, but it was an interesting um, idea. But I thought, okay, does it make more sense to look at this um, as separate subcommunities? Because I thought, what's this, you know, diversity and these cracks that I'm kind of seeing? There are these different approaches and different perspectives on the science reform movement. I thought, how can we kind of capture that? And doesn't that kind of suit what's going on a little bit more? So Etienne Wenger, who is a, um, a social learning theorist, he wrote some configurations um, of communities are too far removed from the scope of engagement of participants, too broad, too diverse, or too diffuse to be usefully treated as single communities of practice. He implies here that it might be better to think of separate smaller communities of practice, which is kind of where I'm going now. So I took a look at this big network of 2,200 nodes and basically tested it for modularity to see how modular it is or to see how many kind of, does it make sense to, look at little subgroups within 
um, within the bigger group. Um, I don't want to take up too much time. Um, where am I going for time? Um, I basically I will go a little bit quicker through this because I'm. Okay. Um, lots of different algorithms are used. Two key ones kind of come into play here. I'll focus on what I used, however. Um, I ran the Levin uh, algorithm for modularity or network detection, and I found that it consistently, robustly detected the same communities in the same number. It, it varied a little bit, but it hung around four or five communities, um, which was interesting because when you when you look for modularity in a network, you want it to be interpretable. Um, you want to be able to look at that and go, okay, what does this actually mean? Can we kind of can we kind of understand these little communities or is it just seemingly seemingly random groupings of people? Or is there some kind of thing that links these separate groups, you know, um, or the people in these separate groups to one another? So this network is indeed somewhat modular. Um, Q tends to sit between, I think, uh, 0.3 and 0.7. So this is a somewhat modular network. It's not crazy modular, but there is certainly evidence of some kind of subgrouping within within this network. Um, I'll zoom through that a little bit, but I found sort of four main communities and it was really interesting. So this community, for example, is populated with individuals and accounts who are very interested in platforms and uh, the statistical side of the science reform movement. Uh, this one, second community, was consisting almost entirely of journals that were associated with um, with life sciences and that kind of thing, but also open science. So that that was just a community that kept coming up. Communities. It was very interesting to me. This seemed to me to consist of people who've kind of been in the original uh, crisis of confidence sort of side of things, people who were very active in the start of the, uh, you know, open science movement, if we could call it that, and who had a lot to do with um, generating some of the early discourse surrounding the uh, the issues. And finally, Community 4 was very full of people who were interested in open access, libraries, that kind of thing, infrastructure basically that supports open access. And finally, I broke down the main network into these, you know, separate little groupings showing you just um, where some of the main, uh, the, the biggest or the most uh, prominent user accounts were sitting. And a lot of them sit kind of um, within communities of their own, but are also between communities. That's an interesting observation I don't have time to go into now. Um, but that's kind of how the, the communities were sort of settled within the broader the broader uh, group. So there's evidence of, of a sub-community structure, it would seem. And the question then is, you know, does that point to actually separate sub-communities um, or communities of practice? And in Wenger's terms, a constellation of communities of practice. Um, obviously, you know, we're not detecting networks. This is a, an algorithm with which partitions the network um, based on a certain set of parameters. So there are technical limitations there. But the fact that these communities were very, seemed to be very easily um, interpretable was was useful and interesting for me. So working with the constellation concept, this idea of of um, you know a constellation instead of sub communities, there are a lot of reasons for why it makes sense to work with the idea of these sub communities rather than again the monolith of science reform. Um, but there there are reasons they all of these sub communities kind of share historical roots in this greater cause of science reform. There's a lot of overlap. Some people are groups of multi, uh, are members of multiple groups, and some some kind of um, you know overlap and are brokers across groups. Um, there's often competition for for a lot of the same resources, despite the fact that there are different approaches and different priorities and needs in separate sub communities. Um, there's of course natural diversity. There are different groups of uh, communities of practice simply because. The science reform movement is comprised of various kinds of different people and various kinds of approaches. So is it beneficial? Um, recognizing the joint enterprise and the related interconnectivities 
uh, as well as diversity? Does it make sense to do that? Is it is it useful for the movement itself or movements? Um, I think so. I think I think it really can highlight different perspectives. So it facilitates intersection of different perspectives, which is part of what we're talking about um, with the whole reason for this symposium. Considering the constellation approach allows room for plurality um, and for different perspectives, for different needs to be to be appreciated, to be brought to the table. Uh, and it motivates development of, of more and different practices. So, for example, when we make space for multiple different um, um, epistemological approaches, for example, we we can open the, the scope for more stuff. So I like the idea of, of Bart's bureaucratic innovation. We can broaden that scope. You know, what are these forms and this standardization that can occur? We allow that to be uh, inclusive for more kinds of participation in science reform. And I would argue that it develops the effectiveness of the movement, that it, you know, this civilising process that Bart talked about, that it brings that along a little bit. We develop and become more nuanced as a group when we take into account the plurality that can be represented in the science reform movement. Um, so I feel like, oh, terrible. If we ignore a constellation structure, uh, we're going to have problems. We're going to inhibit diversity and, and perspectives. Obviously, that's not a good thing. Um, we reduce collaboration opportunities. When, when we have such a great smorgasbord of all these different approaches, there are so many cool opportunities for collaboration and cross-fertilization or cross-pollinization, which is great. There's also less flexibility to adapt. You know, there are going to be different, we're going to be pulling this movement in different ways in the future and allowing for a little bit of different perspectives here and there allows that to also adapt um, as we go. And I think we see potential fragmentation if we try to get everyone to conform to the same ideals and the same priorities. I mean, registered reports and replication do not apply to all disciplines. And so if we make that a thing, then we're going to exclude people by default and create fr fragmentation. So. There are loads of different ways to sort of exercise this constellation idea in practice, but I'm going to leave it here because I'm already out of time um, and I don't want to be that guy. So thank you for your attention. And uh, yeah. Thank you, Sarah. Um, we have one question already which is, uh, did you posit a taxonomy, flat enumeration of edge types in your network graph? Sorry, I missed that question. What was that question? I'm sorry. Yeah, it was, uh, did you posit a taxonomy, flat enumeration of edge types in your network graph? To be honest, I don't understand the question. Okay. Mm. Sorry. Any, are there any other questions for Sarah Han? Ah, uh, there's a clarification for that question. It's uh, so are nodes just connected or not connected? Sorry, my audio is really strange. Can you repeat the question? So are nodes just connected or not connected? Are nodes just connected or not connected? Yeah. Is that the question? Yeah. Um, no, so so all of the nodes um, in the network, um, there were kind of basically three three different kinds of, of connection. One is no connection at all. One was a single connection, so that you're either followed or following. And a third type is that there was mutual connection, which was obviously the thickest kind of edge, which means that there are two connections between the two different nodes. Yeah. Okay. Uh, maybe I can ask a question. You uh, hinted on this a little bit in one slide, but I would, was curious whether you could uh, elaborate a little bit on, on negative consequences of not actually recognizing this diversity or people writing about a reform movement without actually specifying what exactly they mean with this term. Yeah, I mean, I think I think there are, there are kind of different ways of looking at this. You know, I think ultimately, if we consider the science reform movement as being 
a single thing. I think we just miss some of the detail that, that goes into the science reform movement. You know, obviously we have this big goal, which is to improve how we do science. That's a really important goal. But I think if we focus on that and fail to consider the different ways that we can approach that goal and the different strengths and contributions that we can bring to the table, I think that we, we really, really miss out on, on all of the benefits and the progress that can come from that. You know, when we, when we have to work together and we, um, we end up with really cool interdisciplinary, for example, collaborations, you know, where we're pushed into ways that we wouldn't otherwise have been likely to be pushed into, you know, um, pre-registration for qualitative research is only somewhat new. And if we didn't have the room for that kind of uh, development of that kind of approach, then it would be very difficult for qualitative researchers to participate, for example. So I think the more interest we have in, in different contributors and different kinds of contribution, the further we can go as a movement. Yeah, thank you. I think uh, another question could be, or it's more like a comment, but I think you could maybe say something to it. Is uh, I think the idea that describing a community as a community must imply a monolith is one worth digging further into, to be honest. Yeah, no, I, I don't disagree with that. I think that's a great point. Um, I think what I mean by that is just that it's often treated in that way. So it's not so much what we call it. It's more that what that implies for how we discuss it. Uh, I think if we, if we talk about it as being a monolith, we, we're allowed then to just ignore the different kinds of contributions. And, and it, it, it gives it this solid homogeneous quality that I think just, it doesn't really, it doesn't really bring out those beautiful colors and different textures that this landscape has. So it's not, it's not so much that, that it implies that. I think that just in practice, what ends up happening is that's how we think about it. Yeah, I think uh, another comment that might be interesting to consider is uh, it would be interesting to link the Twitter network to the published literature to look at similarities and differences between the structure and inequality of discourse on Twitter and in the scientific literature. What do you think about that? No, I think so. I think that'd be fantastic. Um, yeah. I mean, I, I think the only issue is that, you know, our, our Twitter network is now no longer. So many people have moved to different platforms just because of what happened with Twitter. So I think, unfortunately, you know, this is an issue with any kind of social media study is that platforms become obsolete. That's a massive limitation. Um, and so I think it would be really cool to be able to link some kind of network structure to a, a, say a, a structure within literature citations. I think that that would yield some very cool results if we could do that. Yeah. Another question is, uh, if you don't take everything, so it's about your comment about the open science buffet. And uh, it's about, do you have any thoughts on how we can expand the movement by making it easier to enter without having the whole buffet table shoved down your throat and people being turned off because it feels overwhelming? Yeah, no, I, I think that's that's what I love about the um, about the buffet idea. Um, you know, we... I think part of it is just expanding how we talk about it and how we, how we think about it. You know, we're always focusing on replication. No offense to, to all the fantastic people here who've talked about replication today, but that seems to be such a focus, such a focus on registered reports and pre-registration. I think framing the discussion to be about bigger things and values um, and just opening the discussion, I think already allows room for the buffet idea to, to take root. I think that's really part of it. Um, sorry, um, my daughter's here and she's distracting me a little bit. I'm so sorry. Okay, uh, I would just say thank you. And I think we can now come to our next presenter, which is uh, Nicole Nelson.
And Nicole is Associate Professor in the Department of Medical History and Bioethics at the University of Medicine, Wisconsin. Uh, Wisconsin Medicine, sorry. Uh, Nicole, stage is yours. Okay, thank you very much. And thank you for these great talks so far. I think that, oh, 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 my slides are way off of where they should be. Let me just fix that. You get a little preview of the talk to come. Okay, so I think that my talk is going to be very complimentary to a lot of the talks that um, we have talked about or that we've had so far in that my interest as well is in this idea of epistemic heterogeneity and in thinking through the various reforms that we've seen come out of the meta science and open science movements and the impact that they have on heterogeneity in terms of the um, methods used and the sort of techniques used within the literature. Now, fortunately for me, I think because Bart has already introduced you to some of these big team science forms, like the um, many, many projects, as well as the Psych Science Accelerator, I won't spend too much time on this and instead save some of my time uh, for later on. But what I do wanna say about this is a lot of these movements have explicitly styled themselves after other kinds of big science projects in the physical sciences, sometimes making direct reference to these projects as the inspiration for how it is that they think new forms of scientific work could look. So in addition to the physical sciences as inspirations, we see some other kinds of inspirations here for example, the Camarades group in their multi-part study looked towards the clinical sciences as an idea for a new type of work form that they could adopt, where they were trying to run preclinical pre animal studies in a form that was very similar to the way that clinical trials are run, where they're distributed across a large network of hospitals who all participate using a shared protocol, and then they have a data safety and monitoring board that then groups all of these things together. So here, the um, exemplar is not physical sciences, it's clinical sciences, but it has a sort of similar flavor to it, although maybe a little bit more distributed. Another initiative that I think is worth putting on the table here as another example of big team science is the movement towards cloud labs or so-called automated or self-driving labs. And these are movements not to necessarily group together the people, but to get people using a common platform that shares a little bit more with some of the movements we've seen like for pre-registration and other tools that we're trying to get people to use. In this case, the idea would be that you have many people using a common suite of laboratory instruments, and that makes their data more comparable and easier to sort of interpret across the many people who are using the same platform. So in this talk today, what I wanna think about is whether or not these open science, meta science innovations that we see in terms of work practices might have the implication of reducing heterogeneity in scientific practices. And I don't mean this as a sort of conscious intention on anyone's part. What I'm asking about is whether these types of practices make it more difficult to maintain heterogeneity. Now, just a few clarifying things. This is not an argument that I wanna make about the need for exploratory research vis-a-vis -vis confirmatory research. I think there's lots of good work already that argues that um, the meta science movement should not be about eliminating exploratory research, that there is a need for that, but that confirmatory research is really sort of the target of intervention on which a lot of meta science um, techniques or reforms are aiming to operate. So I am also thinking particularly here about confirmatory research and heterogeneity within that space, rather than the heterogeneity of exploratory versus confirmatory versus other kinds of research. This is also not an argument about why replication or meta science reforms are not appropriate standards or tools for all fields. Um, we have several good arguments in the literature about that, including a paper by Bart Penders and colleagues that are arguing that the kinds of reforms being proposed by the meta science movement are not necessarily reforms that are effective or reasonable for all different disciplines. And I agree with that, but that is not the kind of heterogeneity that I'm interested in today. My target is more in line with what has been called the generalizability crisis, or I see that in the chat here, somebody has linked to a very recent nature commentary piece talking about academic monocultures as being one potential risk of AI focused solutions. And this is the thing that I am interested in talking about today is whether the kinds of innovations that we see taking place in meta science could lead towards a monoculturing of different methods or standards or people or disciplines. So this is what I am going to be focusing on. 
Now, rather than giving you empirical research from the meta-science movement itself, as Bart has done today, what I am going to do is actually use a historical case study to outline the premise for asking this question. And it's my view, um, wearing my historian hat, because I work kind of half-half between a, uh, history and ethnography, that a better metaphor for thinking about what collaboratives look like within um, the meta-science movement is not big team science, um, thinking about things like the Large Hadron Collider or something like this that are, as Bart pointed out, centrally funded, have these large administrative structures. But instead, the example that I want to point to as being comparable and good to think with are the history of model organism communities. These communities, as I will show you, are a little bit more self-organized, they're more distributed, they have flatter hierarchies, and they didn't depend largely on central funding. And in many ways, I think that these communities actually look quite a bit like um, the types of communities that we see arising today associated with the open science and meta science reform movements. So let me give you a really quick run through of two communities that I think are exemplary for thinking about what's going on in meta science today. And that is the Drosophila community and the C. elegans community. In the case of the Drosophila community, we really have sort of an almost an accidental collaborative emerge in some ways, in that Thomas Hunt Morgan in his original lab was not really intending to grow a giant community of people that were looking at heritability and um, mapping chromosomes and Drosophila, but it happened almost by virtue of the material properties of what he was working with being flies. He had all of these mutants that he was making in the lab and he was trying to map each mutation that he saw you know, white eyes back to a specific place on the chromosome. And at some point had so many more mutations than he actually had time to research these mutations. And so started trying to recruit people in to study some of these other mutants that he had come up with. And so he began sharing openly the mutants that he had developed, as well as requesting researchers to share back the fly mutants that they had developed which led to the creation of this informal network of different strains that you could order from a centralized service run by Morgan's lab. So in the image on the left, you see an image of a researcher early 20th century holding the Drosophila Information Service newsletter, which was a list of all of these different fly strains that you could order, and then the little milk bottles of flies where you could write into them and say, please send me some eggs for this mutant. So I think in this case, we see a lot of features that are quite similar to what we would see um, aspirationally speaking in open science communities today, where we have open sharing of resources, we have these informal publications that also included things that looked like preprints, where researchers would share work in progress before it was published. And we also see um, this coordinating uh, sort of ethos emerge not from a centralized body, but from the network itself. That type of community structure um, is very similar to what develops in the C. elegans community post-World War II, all this, this time with a little bit more intention. Um, the core member of this community, Sidney Brenner, was somebody who was very interested in developing a community around C. elegans as a research organism in order to use it as a model for understanding the human nervous system. So it was um, not, not an organic process, but it was an intentionally directed process where he was trying to recruit people and trying to build up a community that would be structured around principles of openness and sharing. Once again, we see things that look like preprints, um, where in the C. elegans newsletter, people are sharing works in progress. There's also sharing and disclosure of methods. So many of the entries in the C. elegans newsletter are actually describing different techniques for how it is that people do things, sharing and disclosing the knowledge. And we also see movement of materials and strains between this community. Now, these community structures are ones that in the history of science um, make them sort of famous for the productivity that they managed to achieve in terms of collective projects of trying to map different parts of organisms. So in the case of the fly community, what the fly community was most interested in doing was taking all of these different mutations that they were seeing and using them as a tool to create one of the first maps of a chromosome and understand which traits map to which locus on which chromosomes such that they could build out these collective maps. Because they were sharing materials so that they could use materials in common, sharing their work at an early stage, uh, and communicating all of this within the group, they were able to sort of self-organize so that they didn't have as many overlapping projects so that everybody could kind of take a piece of the chromosome or a couple of mutations and work out what that looked like and then add it back in together in order to create the map of a chromosome. 
Likewise, in the case of the C. elegans community, one of the main projects for this community was to create a complete map of the nervous system of the worm. And so here again, we see a sort of distribution of resources and labor and focus such that people in this community were each taking a little piece and then collectively donating it back such that this group of people was able to create a complete map of all of the cells um, within the worm and their sort of destinies in terms of what nerves they formed or not. So I think that this shows us one of the benefits of collective labor and open systems of scientific working is that they can be very efficient when people all get interested in a similar topic and work together to share the resources and you see a sort of self-organizing emerge from these communities. But I think that what I would like to focus on more today is that this had consequences for how life science was done more broadly that I don't necessarily think those model organisms intended or model organism communities intended at all. So these communities were trying to make progress on a very specific question of interest to them. Um, what are the sort of physical substrates of heredity, the chromosomes, and can we figure out how they work? How is the nervous system organized? And can we figure out how developmentally um, cells give rise to different parts of the nervous system? But the system that they created in order to do this of sharing information and practices meant that their research community style was incredibly productive and therefore started to outcompete other kinds of styles within some areas of the life sciences. The image that I have for you here on the screen is a study that is published in the journal Genetics that looks at publications in that journal from 1960 to 2010. And it does a very simple analysis of asking for each article published in that journal, does that article use an organism which is considered to be a model organism, which is an official designation that the NIH gives later on in the 90s, versus a non-model organism. And they use the NIH definition to basically, you know, separate out presence absence. Is this a model organism or a non-model organism? And what you can see is that from 1960 up to 2010, over the course of 50 years, we see a huge change in the way that science is done, where organisms like flies, like C. elegans, like Arabidopsis, become not just in the mix in the community, but really the dominant form of actually doing science. So we go from a 50-50 split within the journal genetics to something like an 85-15 split, where the strong majority of publications in that journal today are publications that are using model organisms. This is something that life scientists have really wanted to sound the alarm on as being an area of concern because it's a type of monoculturing that they see as coming with substantial risks. So I've given you two examples of some of that discourse. One is a little nature piece um, by life scientist Jessica Bolker, who is talking about the difficulties of trying to use organisms that are not rats or mice or flies as a researcher who wants to study more and different organisms, because it can be difficult to get funding for these entities because there's so much more work and time involved. And so the productivity outputs that you see can't really compare to people using these standard organisms who now have all of these tools at their disposal, like all of these maps of the nervous system of the worm. They don't have to build these out, they can just use them. And so in terms of trying to ensure heterogeneity within the community, it becomes quite difficult because the more successful the model organisms are, the more costly it is to try and study any other organism. The article that is on the right side of your screen by science journalist Daniel Engber summarizes a bunch of different discussions in the field that are about the particular problems with the models that have risen to prominence as models. Now, remembering that everybody selected these models for their own individual purposes, nobody was necessarily saying, hey, mice, that's what absolutely everyone should use. And yet that is what has happened historically in model organisms research is that a few models ended up becoming the de facto standard. And so we see these founder effects basically of the one thing that people chose at the time now becoming the standard, even though it has flaws. So one of the thing that this article discusses, for example, is that black six, by far the most popular strain of mice used in biomedical research today, has a number of properties that really make it an outlier on a bunch of common physiological and behavioral tests. Like, for example, it likes to drink alcohol, which is very unusual for rodent species, probably because the alcohol doesn't taste so bad to black six mice as opposed to other mice. And so it is a weird model in a lot of ways because it's unlike its rodent counterparts in its proclivity for alcohol, as well as a number of its other behavioral properties. Now, within the meta-science literature, the contemporary meta-science literature, I think that we have 
discussion of these kinds of problems. The model organism community story gives us a story about how it is that people might focus in on one particular organism, but we also have a bunch of literature that talks about focusing in on one particular method or relying too much on studies conducted in one particular environment. And so, for example, some of the work coming out of Hanno Verbal's group in collaboration with the Camarades folks is to try and look at the problems of relying on even well-powered studies that are coming out of only one lab. So in this image that I've taken from one of their PLOS biology papers, here, you can see that this is a visual argument, essentially, for why it's actually better to have three different labs conducting an experiment under slightly different conditions, because you get a more realistic sense of the distribution of a phenotype than if you had one large powered study, but only con uh, conducted under one set of circumstances. And so the question that I want to raise for the discussion is, in these collective forms of work that we see emerging associated with open science and meta science reforms, like Psych Science Accelerator or the multi part study or the many baby study, are they going to end up looking more like giant labs that are all conducting things under the same set of protocols, circumstances, etc.? Or are they going to look more like this other future where you have many studies being conducted under slightly different conditions, which then allows you to do an assessment of variation and heterogeneity? So I think that there are two fair objections, which I agree partially with, um, to thinking about open science or meta science um, reforms as encouraging homogeneity. And one is, is that for many of these reforms, I think people would argue that we're not asking people to standardize at all. All we're asking them to do is document. And so um, one example that probably many people know is this one case study coming to us from oncology, wherein two labs were using ostensibly the same protocol, but getting very different results. And they did quite a detailed analysis to figure out what differed between their labs. And the difference is as trivial as one group using a shaker to more vigorously agitate their cells versus one using a magnetic stir. And so the conclusion of the article that they published here in Cell Reports was just to say, make sure you report this. They didn't say, use this one, not that one. They just said, make sure that you report this. But I think it's also a little bit disingenuous to say that reporting alone doesn't change practices. Because time and time again, when I hear people talk about the impact of reporting checklists, they do in, 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 uh, intend them to be things that change practices, as well as just things that increase transparency. For example, the idea that if you're going to submit an article and you have to tick off whether or not you actually blinded or masked your studies, you may feel embarrassed about enough about the fact that you have to check, no, I didn't, but the next time around you adopt that practice. Now, in the case of blinding or masking, that's not something that we might think of as especially problematic because it doesn't really create a monoculture. That's just kind of a bias reducing measure as opposed to the focus on one model organism or one protocol. But I think there are other ways in which we see that meta science innovations do in fact create a default standard, which could encourage homogenization. So this is kind of a blurry image here, but it's taken from a screenshot of a cloud lab um, infrastructure software, where the cloud, the idea of the cloud lab is that even for something as simple as washing cells or stirring cells, there are a whole number of parameters that when you do this through robotics, you have to specify. And that in fact, it's a great idea to get people to use these platforms because then they are forced to specify all kinds of things that would otherwise go unreported in their procedures. The trick here that I wanna to point to is that this piece of software comes with default settings. And so in order to actually change the settings, you gotta pop open the box and change the parameters manually, which I suspect means that more people than not will end up just accepting the default parameters, meaning that we get essentially one way of washing cells or at least much less variation in the way that people wash cells, such that something like this might not have even come to light because people weren't using different methods of stirring if they were all adopting the same default setting uh, suggested by a common platform. Now, the second um, objection that I can uh, foresee that I think has some merit to and that I have some sympathy for is that perfect standardization is impossible already. The, the, the natural world kicks up an absolute ton of variation. And so we don't really have to be that worried about too much standardization because there's buckets and buckets of it. So if a little bit of homogeneity sort of creeps in, whatever, fine, because the natural world gives us tons. And I think that is both true and not true. And because I'm pretty much at time, I don't have 
a great amount of time here to give you the detailed version of this story coming out of the mouse model literature on the background effect. But suffice it to say that the moral of this story is that in this case, what we had was one lab who was creating a mouse model that then was used in a number of tests by a whole host of other labs. And because that lab was the only person creating this model, it took quite some time to figure out that the specific way that they were making the model had a bunch of variation going on in the background that was actually significant. They thought that because they were making a model that was missing a gene, had a gene knockout, that it didn't really matter what was going on elsewhere in the genome because the impact of this knockout would be so profound. That turned out not to be the case. In fact, the other genes were interacting with the knockout in significant ways. But because there was only one construct available initially, it took time for that to come to light. So, I will stop there now, but I would like to open it up for things that I would love to hear your thoughts on. And the first is this, to what extent do you think this model organisms case that I have given you here is similar to or different from contemporary open science and meta science practices? Does this make a better metaphor to think with than things like, um, you know, giant physical sciences projects? I'm also curious to hear what elements of your work practices in the area that you are practicing, if any, do you think are becoming more homogenous because they're easier to use or the tools are better understood. So even if no one is actually telling you, use this protocol, this is the standard, you may choose this protocol because it has so much literature attached with it, because it's well described, because the instruments that you need to use for it are already out there and freely available. And in this way, I think people do potentially get encouraged to focus in on a few sets of techniques. So I'm curious to hear if this resonates with your experiences. And then finally, I'm curious to hear from the audience what initiatives you think I might better should follow in order to better understand these changing work practices that are part of meta science and open science reforms. So there are many, many projects, as well as you know the Psych Science Accelerator, tons of different things. So I'm curious about what you think might be interesting empirical sites to follow to look at this process of methods development in order to be able to understand whether or not some of these work practices sort of tip the scale in favor of homogeneity rather than heterogeneity. Okay, I will leave it there. Thank you very much. Thank you, Nicole. Uh, we have uh, one question in the Q&A, which is whether the risks of collective labor could be recast as the benefits of collective modeling shared models. <laughs> yeah, I it is it is inarguable, I think, that this is a style of work that had a lot of benefits to it. And I don't want to say that this is um, not something that was beneficial. It very clearly was, right? You see these communities making a lot of progress with what are pretty rudimentary tools for the time on these projects, like, you know, mapping the fate of every cell within C. elegans. So there are certainly benefits here. The question is about the balance of risk and benefits. Like, at what point do these tools become so good <laughs> that other tools are no longer competitive. And that is really the question that I am interested in is if we see uneven distribution of meta science, open science reforms, such that we have one suite of tools that becomes really easily accessible to people while other tools are lagging behind, does that then create these founder effects where we see people making rapid progress, but with only one set of tools that may have some intrinsic flaw that might get discovered only 10, 20 years down the line? Yeah. Uh, another question is, uh, standardization has occurred a lot in molecular biology, take sequencing, plasmid preparations, etc. Yeah. There are kits for so much now that is standardized and it enabled innovation on top of that. This doesn't preclude someone going back and sequencing by hand, for example, but it has led to advances not possible before. How do you think what you discussed relates to this type of technique homogenization? Yeah, that's a great question. And in fact, I uh, years ago tried to launch a project on exactly this, looking at DNA sequencing technologies, because one of the things that I was seeing in laboratories is that I was working with some laboratories who would, for example, describe themselves as an Illumina shop and that they were in no way going to adopt new sequencing technologies because they had invested all of this time and effort in being able to understand the particular quirks and foibles of the Illumina system. Uh, and so what I'm not totally clear on is the extent to which if you become an Illumina shop, 
um, you miss out on opportunities that other sequencing platforms might actually give you. What is clear to me is that people are not using multiple sequencing platforms. That is something that is too high an in investment. So I think the question that we need to be able to ask is, what is lost basically when this, homog uh, you know, this homogenization actually happens? It seems to happen. And so do we lose something meaningful when people become an Illumina shop and don't experiment with a variety of other tools in order to understand how the failing of one tool might supplement the failing of another such that we get a more complete set of information? Yes, uh, again, thank you, Nicole. And uh, now we are coming to our final presentation today, which is held by Bernard Evesa. Bernard is Associate Professor in the Department of Business at the University of Idaho. Please go ahead. All right. Well, thank you, everyone, uh, for being here and for sticking around until the last presentation. So today I want to talk to you a little bit about the dogmas and uh, evidential standards in meta-science and why this is a good time for a makeover for um, meta-science. First, I'll give you a um, prologue uh, by Farah Robin to set the stage for my talk. As you may know, Farah Robin stood firmly against scientific indoctrination and cautioned us against many dogmatic traps of uh, scientism. And this essay called How to Defend Society Against Science, he says about the cautious, non-dogmatic approach to um, learning and um, generating knowledge, says this will slow us down, no doubt. But are we supposed to charge ahead simply because some people tell us that they have found an explanation for all the misery and an excellent way out of it? And concludes this essay with the following statement with a hat tip to Socrates. The hardest task needs the lightest hand, um, or else its completion will not lead to freedom, but to a tyranny much worse than the one it replaces. So I will draw some parallels between Fire Robin's warning about changing, um, charging the head with a heavy hand and the risk of making things worse than before while carrying the conversation forward um, to, to our current post-replication crisis context. Given the topic, I will assume that most of you, uh, most of the symposium audience is already familiar with the um, background of replication crisis, so I'll save you a historical overview. But I just want to emphasize that science reform and meta-science emerged as a backdrop of poor scientific practices, um, unreliable results, and a massive resistance to change. And as such, the predominant focus of science reform so far has been on instigating uh, motivating and activating social change. So in this first scientific utopia paper um, by in, in 2012 by Nozick and Bar Anand, they put it um, as follows. We argue that the barriers to these improvements are not technical or financial, they are social. The barriers to change are a combination of inertia, uncertainty about alternative publication models, and the existence of groups invested in the inefficiencies of the present system. Our ultimate goal is to improve scientific um, research efficiency by bringing scientific communication practices closer to scientific values. And perhaps out of this urge to tackle these social barriers first and foremost, certain priorities emerged in the reform agenda. And uh, I used an earlier version of this slide that I'll just show you um, three years ago in the previous um, Critical Meta Science Symposium by uh, COS. And I'll just show you a revised version of it with much of the contact, um, content intact because it's still relevant. Science reform has so far prioritized uh, certain issues, such as larger sample sizes, preventing and discouraging or drawing attention to at least um, p-hacking, large-scale adoption of pre-registration and maybe registrant uh, report as well uh, can be counted here, um, replication studies, um, and increasing research transparency, openness, uh, encouraging open methods as well. And things, certain things got deprioritized in turn, and I do not mean that intentionally, rather this was a um, de facto um, deprioritization just by way of other things dominating the core um, reform agenda. So among these things that remained out of focus um, are, can, are included Sample quality, um, model building and selection issues, and model misspecification or specification 
approaches to systematic exploration, um, theory development, and inference quality and formalism in meta methods. So from my perspective, this uh, picture translates into a prioritization of procedures over the actual content of science. So such a pr prioritization eventually gave rise to some cultural artifacts and heuristics. That's going to be the focus of my talk today. For example, meta science has become motivated by um, a need to activate the scientific community to change rather than to understand scientific phenomena better. So like the meta focus became uh, much more important. Meta scientific practice has focused on quick action and maybe larger studies to validate or debunk uh, results rather than slow, careful, medical scientific progress and understanding. And the scientific community has begun consuming meta-science in a particular way too, maybe um, in a way to confirm their belief that this change needs to happen, um, rather than trying to understand what we actually aim to understand in terms of, um, in terms of again, the substance of science. And some of these heuristics have become so normalized as to pose a threat of turning into dogma, preventing us from freely and rigorously thinking about science. So let's take a very quick look at some case examples to illustrate what I mean by science being relegated to a secondary role. So the first case example that I'm gonna present is about replications. And the, um, the heuristic that I refer to here is the, the more the merrier heuristic. The assumption, is that every replication is a good replication and we need more of them, and sometimes even indiscriminately so. Um, take the infamous, now infamous, BEM studies, the ESD studies of uh, 2011, that contributed a lot to the instigation of the replication crisis. There was an initial failed replication of these BEM studies in uh, 2012. Then uh, a while later, another set of two studies with uh, very large sample sizes followed, uh, this time in, in, in 2021, this time in a uh, German version of the priming task. And then two large sample studies also reported failed replications in 2022. And finally, a, a multi-stage mega study was published in 2023 with similar findings, again, failed replications. Over the same period, scientists have also critiqued um, then studies from multiple fronts. So the theory was found to be insufficient to be properly tested in these experiments. The study designs were found to be noisy and subject to experimental degrees of freedom. Um, and the results were found to be not robust to different types of uh, alternative analyses, basically. So based on my work, on the theoretical foundations of replication and how they work, I always get questions whenever I see a new BEM replication or other similar replications. So why do we keep running such flawed studies or rerunning such flawed studies? And when we will decide that it's enough and we'll stop running further replications? And maybe most importantly to me is, what is it that we have learned about ESD from all of these replications over time that we could not have said a priori or based on these other critical evaluations. Um, and another way of looking at this is if we were really interested in possibly understanding ESP and we were kind of entertaining the idea that it could be actually real, how would we start studying it? Would we just perform another BAM replication or would we go elsewhere? So whether a replication experiment is what will serve our epistemic goals in a given setting is something that we should um, consider more carefully before performing our next study. So these considerations are exacerbated typically in mega studies, like larger um, multi-site replications. So my case, uh, second case example is gonna come from the growing number and popularity of multi-site replications. As previous um, um, speakers also mentioned, the one example would be the Menlab studies. That's the one that I'm gonna use as well. So here the heuristic that is at play is the bigger the better heuristic. So one of the, um, if we look at the example of many lab studies, some of the things that we found, find here is that uh, while trying to replicate a finding across multiple sites, new 
sources of heterogeneity are introduced at every site. Due to seemingly trivial differences in conditions, procedures, and uh, materials, regardless of the um, extreme levels of standardization that is trying to be um, implemented. Um, the meta-study designs also got extremely complex due to multiple labs, varying sources of error, and restricted randomizations at uh, multiple levels. So we end up with things like um, with split plot designs with several nested factors. And due to this complexity, meta-study analyses are typically performed under misspecified models, um, kind of ignoring some of these complications of the, uh, of the study designs. And sometimes, such as in this particular many labs for study, even a higher level inference is being sought, such as uh, testing a meta hypothesis by assigning different sites to different treatment conditions. And as a result, as we find out in this uh, 2023 paper, um, as, um, Arkham Buzbas, my colleague and I, non-exactness of replications will exacerbate errors in estimates in larger models, such as those used in testing meta hypotheses. The reason is that larger models often require new sound parameters also to be estimated, in addition to parameters of interest. Even if we take the best approach to inference, the non-exactness of replication will be reflected on multiple estimates, resulting in undesirable estimators. So oftentimes, bigger means more complicated, and that means worse inference while creating the opposite impression of higher credibility. So once again, I wonder, what do we learn substantively about the phenomenon under study when we design such large studies without systematically controlling for the sources of heterogeneity or optimizing the experimental design for better inference? Moving away from replications for a bit, my third case example is going to, uh, perhaps unsurprisingly to some of you, is going to be pre-registration. And the heuristic that I will refer to here is that if it exists, it's good. So it's becoming increasingly common to use pre-registered study label as some sort of quality signal or uh, signal of rigor. I just basically did a very simple Google search, uh, Google Scholar search for the phrase pre-registered study. And after 2020, it turned, uh, uh, it returned over 3,000 hits just for the term itself. So the phrase became very popular. Um, it, it, it's being used in a lot of studies nowadays to refer to, you know, like the very generically the pre-registration status. But the more important thing is the heuristic. So I'll use a specific example of this heuristic that um, is presented in the 2023 Nature Human Behavior paper, which is a systematic review paper. And the authors here evaluate systematic evidence for happiness strategies and they exclusively look at pre-registered studies. So I'll quote the authors here, and they say, because pre-registration should substantially reduce the likelihood of false positives, we treat pre-registration as an important component of evidential value. And further add, we provide citations to small non-pre-registered experiments in supplementary information, but we do not discuss these studies below due to their relatively low evidential value. So basically, the authors use the mere existence of pre-registration as a discriminating evidence um, for research quality and rigor without even needing to scrutinize the content of pre-registration. So Bart and I have written uh, a very short paper a letter on this, and there's more uh, that we address there. Um, and of course, this is just a single example, but uh, further evidence has been recently provided by Moin Saed, um, where he posted this preprint a few weeks back, basically. And uh, he analyzed uh, open peer review data and found evidence that editors and reviewers do not mention, access, or compare peer registrations against the article during the review process. So that's the blue parts of the bars that you see there showing the uh, proportion of um, um, pre uh, mentioning, accessing, or comparing pre-registrations. And uh, maybe the lowest one here is um, less than 3.5% of reviewers and editors compared the article to the pre-registration. Syed says about this state of affairs, if a study is pre-registered but nobody checks it during review, does it mean anything? What is the value of a pre-registered article when the pre-registration was not actually evaluated during the review process? 
Very little, I would argue. If reviewers do not examine the pre-registration plant, will the casual reader? Current data suggests no. So once again, instead of helping move science forward, such heuristics are likely to be detrimental to progress by biasing the scientific record in ways we cannot quite even comprehend or anticipate yet. So my last, last case example will concern the whole of uh, science reform and our overall evaluation of it regarding the evidence for effectiveness of science reforms, basically. And I will refer to this heuristic as any evidence is better than no evidence. So, um, to which, of course, this kind of uh, statement, I would say, evidence for what? That's the relevant question. So, in this recent uh, Nature Human Behavior article that came out at the end of 2023, it's called High Replicability of Newly Discovered Social Behavioral Findings is Achievable. Um, the authors report high replicability of some new results in social and behavioral sciences and conclude that this is due to reforms such as, <clears throat> excuse me, registration, um, large samples, and transparency. So this paper and its preprints have already been cited about, uh, at least in Google Scholar, 48 times. And um, Joe Buck Coleman and I wrote a commentary on this paper, which is still being evaluated uh, by the journal. In, in that commentary, we discussed how the meta-study design does not actually support any causal conclusions before the reforms were not subjected to experimental treatment. So there's no control condition within the study. And that the reported replicability metric is very idiosyncratic um, and not necessarily robust uh, as you compare, you know, like other replicability metrics, some of them reported in the supplementary information of the paper. Um, moreover, I think the, the re reported replicability rate is not actually that different from some of the um, other reports, other metrics reported in the literature. Um, by, I, I gave you three examples here, uh, but in, none of these papers were conditioned on reforms, unlike the, the current uh, Nature Human Behavior paper. Also, the effects on their study in this paper were uh, selected on statistical significance, causing selection bias, or if, if you think about it within the study, there is an um, internal publication bias. But most importantly, from my perspective, is that um, uh, the, all of the significant findings in these replications are referred to as discovery without really any discussion of why that should be a discovery or what has been learned in these domains of study over these set of studies, um, or why would that be the preferred approach to discovery? Along with most of the papers that cite, the um, higher replicability paper. The Center for Open Science itself has disseminated these findings with the following phrasing. The reforms are working, evidence that the credibility of social behavioral sciences can be improved. So some other citations refer to these results as conclusive evidence that reforms work without necessarily specifying what work uh, means there with regards to scientific progress. This kind of attitude to me about um, uh, jumping at any kind of evidence in support of science reform is uh, overeager, a little bit premature and careless because we can actually, the evidence is there, we just need to read it correctly and evaluate it accordingly. And maybe it sometimes even comes across to me as a little bit desperate, like are we in such rush to confirm this conclusion that we can't even take the time or afford to actually look at the quality of evidence or the relevance of evidence. So based on these, I mean, these case studies are just to illustrate my point. Um, there are many other examples that I could not fit in this particular presentation. But in conclusion, um, in some ways, I think we have started putting the meta before the science. And there is a growing tendency to do meta science for meta science's sake and to follow or endorse the reforms for reform's sake, rather than taking the time to articulate how, when, or why they would contribute to scientific progress. And there is also some evidence for use and misuse of procedural signals as evidence for quality without further scrutiny. Um, there is also evidence for lowering our evidential standards when evaluating pro-reform results as people who are pro-reform. Um, and, and finally, 
something that Fire Oven warned us against, some evidence for self-congratulations and hubris as if we have figured science out and everything is better already. And I know, like, if we ask this question to anyone, like, do you think this way? And people would deny it, but sometimes actions actually speak louder and they may actually uh, reflect our more honest opinions about this as well. And that's kind of what I'm kind of um, trying to read. Now that the reform movement has gained momentum and there's growing adoption of many of these procedures, I think we can afford to take a step back and slow down. Slow down to uh, the meta makeover that I suggest here is not just the critique of meta science itself. It's about actually meta sciencing critically. It's about um, uh, it's an endorsement of more critical, deliberate, mindful practice and consumption of meta science. So first, I say let's keep our eye on the prize. We got in this in the name of science, so let that be our guiding principle, and let's evaluate everything based on how they contribute to our science in concrete terms. So what have we learned? How have we made progress in advancing knowledge? Um, uh, and how do our meta studies going, to, how are our meta studies going to help us epistemically? Do they help us reach our goals? Um, we need to replace our short-term focus on existence, non-existence type of uh, results to scientific understanding by a long-term, genuine, painstaking exploration. And we need to be more intentional about what we study and why, and maybe divert our focus to stuff we are actually curious about and we aim to continually explore. For example, as opposed to out of a desire to debunk things that we don't actually believe in. And we need to design better studies first and then better, better meta studies, which we can properly specify. We must raise our own evidential standards, both when testing hypotheses we want to be true and when evaluating them. And collectively, we, keep, we need to keep questioning the quality and rigor heuristics that we have established. Um, we need to keep questioning and resist meta science dogmas. And we need to openly invite criticism like this symposium. But not only that, genuinely engage with it and, and, and use it to improve the way we have been doing things and the way we're, we are going to continue doing things. Lastly, we must actively cultivate intellectual humility, accept that we could be wrong, accept that we may have made uh, wrong decisions along the way, and resist hubris. So I will conclude with a quote from Claude Shannon. In 1956, he wrote a piece called The Bandwagon in response to the large-scale, quick, and mindless adoption of information theory by scientists in many disciplines. So this was the concluding paragraph of, of this short paper. And I'd like to invite you to mentally replace information theory that I um, italicized here with um, meta science and scientific reform and communication theory at the end with science. So Shannon says, we must keep our own house in first class order. The subject of information theory has certainly been sold, if not oversold. We should now turn up our attention to the business of research and development at the highest scientific plane we can maintain. Research rather than exposition is the key, is the keynote, and our critical threshold should be raised. Authors should submit only their best efforts, and these only after careful criticism by themselves and their colleagues. A few first-rate research papers are preferable to a large number that are poorly conceived or half finished. The latter are no credit to their writers and a waste of time to their readers. Only by maintaining a thoroughly scientific attitude can we achieve real progress in communication theory and consolidate our present position. So thank you. I'll conclude with this and invite any questions. Thank you, Bernard. This was really interesting. Uh, I don't really have a question yet, but what I do have is an interesting comment that I think uh, a reaction would, would be quite interesting because it uh, addresses the issue of communities actually engaging with each other. So it's a longer comment, but I will only read the end out. It's uh, the general point that insufficient attention is given to theorizing is well taken, but I don't think this is an opposition to methodological reform. Framing methodological reform as unrigorous science is unhelpful and unnecessarily antagonizing. 
I kind of would have expected that kind of comment. Uh, well, this is a critical meta science symposium, and that's that's what I meant to bring to the table. Um, nowhere, I think here, I said that the whole reform is just this. I am just uh, trying to caution people in that kind of heuristic representation of reforms, not thinking about the mindless implementation of them. It doesn't mean that everything reform has done is this. So it, this is just a warning that this is possible and it's happening somewhere and it's increasing in frequency as well in terms of, you know, like not re not reading pre-registration, for example, or automatically doing replication. Um, I am a meta scientist myself, so yeah, I know, like, uh, there is a lot of good work. I believe that my work is good. Yeah, another comment is uh, formulated as a question is, while I understand the criticism here, I wonder if this truly reflects how the majority have adopted open science practices. Yes, there are many projects and approaches, but most simply now pre-register. They preprint and maybe make data and R code open. Is this really a runway train? A runaway train? Um, it's an interesting comment. No, I don't know. I don't know whether this is the, the mainstream trend. I don't know to what extent this represents um, uh, how much or how much of meta science or scientific reform is being implemented. I think this is a fair warning regardless, regardless of how frequently it is being taken this way. I think it applies. Uh, it doesn't necessarily have to apply to everyone for it to be relevant. That's, that's my point. Thank you, Benno. And now we are going to have our panel discussions, uh, panel discussion, where you can ask our panel everything that comes to mind related to reform movements or anything that you want, like, would like to ask about the presentations. But uh, I think we could also quickly start by asking our presenters whether they want to ask another presenter anything because I saw during the presentation sometimes there was also a hand up by our presenters so maybe we can give them a chance to ask each other questions and spark the discussion. Yeah, I, I would like to open that I think by talking about something that came to mind during many of the presentations um, that I heard, essentially all of them. Um, but never was was never made really explicit. Namely, how do we think that these trends in in meta science, whether that is bureaucratization, homogenization, um, using heuristics instead of thinking well, etc., um, how all of that is related to notions of de-skilling, um, like these molecular biology kits that. Tim uh, uh, typed about in um, in the comments and, and Nicole referred to, that was already then, um, th they were introduced in the context of, of, of debates of de-skilling. If you can't sort of make your reagents yourself and do all the work yourself, you're not really worthy of being a molecular biologist. Uh, so, um, and, and is this, these tools that we are being handed, these procedures that are being developed and optimized, is that de-skilling science in some way or another? Do I need to answer it myself or do I need to point at somebody to, oh, Thomas wants to go. Okay, go ahead. Uh, okay, I'll have a go. Um, yeah, I mean, I, I think this is something that has, I've seen kind of crop up a lot in the debates, um, particularly around, you know, when it comes to workload, there seems to be almost sort of, sort of two schools of thought, which are, you know, we need to train researchers to be to do open science um and how to um you know do pre-registrations how to share data how to share materials how to write reproducible r code um and then they're kind of at the same time there's this perspective of saying like well we shouldn't expect researchers to be specialist software engineers at the same time as as being experts in 
I don't know, cancer or, or things like that. And actually we should move to team-based research and it should be the team that has these skills. Um, and I, I've kind of never really seen that um, sort of resolved really about, you know, should probably the answer is not to move to one of the extremes entirely, but it does seem to me to kind of be a bit of a tension here about saying like, well, it, it seems a bit odd to kind of try and do both things at once. Like either we try and specialize people to have certain open science, certain skills, or we should try and develop like more rounded scientists who can do everything. Um, and I think probably the most interesting perspective I read on this sort of comes from uh, the the higher academic, the higher education literature where um, there's this really cool paper. I'll put it in the chat by a guy called Bruce McFarlane who who basically argues that even the term, even what it means to do research in the kind of current climate of sitting down, planning a research project that you do and then you write up, is de-skilling a broader perspective of what used to be like an academic um, where you know you research isn't just something that like an individual project that you sit down and do it's a kind of broader intellectual engagement with a whole topic and it involves sort of sitting around and discussing with other academic things and reading stuff and and that in itself is all research rather than a sort of you know doing a specific project um <clears throat> But yeah, I'd be interested to hear sort of other people's perspectives on that idea of like, yeah, should should we be training specialists to do all these different things, or should we be kind of upskilling academics in all these different areas, or and how 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 do you kind of resolve that when you're trying to plan reforms? Yes, Stefan. Um, yeah, just quickly, I'm, I don't have an answer to the to the question you just posed. I was just thinking with because um, there's a comment as well with AI and de-skilling and all that, and this kind of there's this interesting narrative which actually I think is fed by a lot of the replication crisis narrative activism um, about you know if you look at any thermoscientific, scientific, thermo Fisher, whatever, all these companies they all say like increase your reproducibility and blah 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 by by bringing in automation and often then there's this sentence like there's immediately the worry that the human goes out and all this but then it's always like it's mere manual labor that will be taken over the researcher will stu still do the real science so it's kind of goes back to the to the point that tom just made as well kind of where is the real science being done and what kind of skill or what kind what does it entail but like i'm I'm always curious about this this notion of mere manual labor because a lot happens when I just do the pipetting and kind of I don't know it's just kind of there's there's these narratives of what we can lose and what not what skills are relevant and what skills are just like can be blended out and just in reply to Bart's original question I'm also maybe I'm not worried about de-skilling like when I when I did my PhD in biochemistry we started using more and more kits I didn't think it was getting easier or I, I lost skills or kind of, I, but right now I'm more maybe worried about outskilling because again, with automation, people are saying, well, we don't need to use normal pipettes anymore. We can transfer liquids in different way. And kind of, it, it moves into an area where it's, it's a different kind of processes maybe being used that we cannot, you know, it's, it goes into opaqueness and all that kind of how, where can we still tap into the process and kind of establish trust and reliability and all this. It, I'm not sure, but that's just one of the worries, maybe. Yes, uh, Nicole. Yeah, I might argue that we could reframe the de-skilling problem and maybe think of it in two different ways. And I'm going to be historical case study guy today. But um, one good analogy that we could draw, I think, is with the evidence-based medicine movement. And there's some really nice work showing there that this tension between um, sort of like skilling and de-skilling is there as well, and is maybe a fundamental detention or tension in reform movements. So for example, in EBM, the reform of the curriculum for med school was all focused on people becoming critical consumers of the literature and figuring out how to use these sort of critical reasoning skills. But in terms of the EBM reforms in practice, it was a much more technocratic 
here are evidence-based guidelines and you must follow them all. <laughs> and so that may be a skill that's just inherent to reform movements or attention that's inherent to reform movements. It may be also a thing that we could think of as a problem with technocratic approaches, which maybe relates to what Berna is talking about, that when you have a sort of technocratic prescriptive way of here's how you need to do science, then that is maybe, yeah, de-skilling is maybe a good word for it, I think. Um, yeah, my thoughts. I think I have I have a question uh, in case no one else ha has one. Uh, it is kind of uh, an aspect that hasn't been addressed yet so much, but you read a little bit about it when you read critical perspectives on the reform movement and especially on meta science. That people tend to have a certain background when they are in meta science or when they are in science of science. And I think an interesting question would be how much do you think the background of the actual researchers who do meta science or are involved in these reform movements influence the appropriateness of the reforms for types of research or research cultures um i'll have a go um, so one of the things that we hear most in the context of that type of discussion is the over-reliance on quantitative studies when it comes to meta-science. Um, and if you take meta-science as critical evaluations of research practices in the broadest sense, if that's the definition, then meta-science has been around for centuries. Um, and most of it has not been quantitative. Um, so essentially, the quantitative element of it is a, an innovation, um, post-World War II innovation, uh, for the most part in that sense. Um, and um, sure, so if that is sort of the epistemic culture you come from yourself uh, with the moral programs and ideal articulations of science sort of embedded in that program and as a result also in you, um, then that means that you will bring a variety of ideals with you into um, your meta science project. That is in itself actually not that much of a problem as long as alternative articulations also exist. Um, but they don't, or they do actually, um, but they exist in different spaces. So we do have history of science, sociology of science, philosophy of science, and we have meta science, but they speak to different audiences in different voices. Um, and these meetings, are specifically orchestrated to get them all together. And then for a moment we do, um, and then we sort of articulate the plan that we should do this more often and make this sort of a structural engagement, but it doesn't stick, uh, at least not until now, not so much. Um, I hope it does uh, and I hope it changes and that today is the moment that it changes, but probably not. Um, and I think that that is something that we need to, well, consider as one of the biases, if we want to use that term anyway, one of the biases that meta science essentially introduces in in its project to reduce all sorts of other biases. Thank you. What, what do the others think? Yeah, I, I certainly agree with Bart on that one. And it's hard to tell how much of that is our own biases as qualitative researchers towards the value of what qualitative research can bring. But I think it is the case that a uh, trap that sometimes meta scientists can fall into is assuming that they understand what the experience of doing this work uh, is like for scientists who are not like them. Because scientists or meta scientists having been born out of a particular scientific field have experienced a spectrum of scientific training there's sometimes a problem wherein they use their own experiences to interpolate out to the rest of the community and what their experiences have been like without actually doing the qualitative research to see if that is indeed the lived experience of other people in the field. I think that meta science is getting a lot better about that, but I think there's a lot more room for systematically collecting information about 
what science is like for differently positioned people, such that we can have a better understanding of how a particular reform or intervention would fall on people who are living and working in different, you know, scientific careers, essentially. Yeah, I definitely um, agree with that as well. And I think a, a sort of a good example is that a lot of people, well, myself included, are, you know, I'm, my background's in psychology. I got into, you know, becoming aware of open research through the whole discourse of the replication crisis. And I think that a lot of people, especially potentially like well-known people within the movement, had similar backgrounds kind of coming from psychology and quantitative replication crisis and a lot of the reforms like pre-registration were perfect for dealing with the issues that we encountered there right you know p-hack quantitative studies but i've definitely been in discussions where people have have kind of almost taken a perspective like oh we need to you know spread the gospel of of open research to other disciplines you know because it's been useful for us to like improve the way that we do science and psychology um you know so let, let's go and see how pre-registrations can help with like history and then it always kind of strikes me as like it's almost like you have a solution and you're looking for a, a problem um which doesn't always seem the kind of right way around to do it Yeah, I, I think an interesting question, maybe also for everyone, is a question that was uh, posed for Bart before, is uh, can you speak to the relationship between mechanical objectivity and I guess also this process of automation and what he called this uh, post-human epistemology uh, with the aim of the very widely proposed, uh, uh, asked for fair principles and also with this machine action actionability. And I think this is also probably related to the issue of that machine learning is getting more and more involved into the actual science processes. Maybe, Bart, you can start since the question was first posed to you. Uh, and then... Yes, yeah. Um, so the, this, this whole idea of mechanical objectivity, of course, sort of speaks to the idea that we are the problem. Um, and if you get rid of us, um, then at least you solve that problem. Um, maybe not all problems of the world, but at least that one. Um, and, um, well, let me disclose first, um, which is a sort of a positionality statement, that I, I do not subscribe to mechanical objectivity. I firmly believe that um, it is unattainable in the sense that you you cannot remove humans or traces of humans from the process. Uh, so if you remove the humans, you are still left with the traces of the humans, uh, whether that is in a racist AI or in some sort of imperfect machine. Um, so um, that means that um, in many situations, it might not be problematic to strive for something resembling uh, mechanical objectivity, as long as we all recognize that it is essentially um, unattainable, just like the actual truth is unattainable and you can strive for it. The same goes for mechanical objectivity. Um, but the, the fact that we do try means that we also have sort of developed tools and instruments and concepts and things that should get us there. And some are, um, uh, yeah, playing that part really well, um, but none of them actually do it um, because they all essentially rely on um, human actors to work, even AI does. So, um, yeah, the, the question is, well, can you speak more about the relationship? Well, yeah, sure. I, I would say that the relationship is, is fictional, um, but very powerful. Um, and we all have to somehow relate to, um, to that fiction all the time, even if we don't really want to. Yes, Nicole. 
Yeah, so I, I thought I would chime in a little on the question of mechanical objectivity, since I've been thinking about this a lot as someone who is about to become the embedded ethnographer in a large scale automation project to create a self driving lab at Carnegie Mellon. And I think that what we could say from the very extensive literature on ethnography of the bench sciences, at least, and this may not hold true for other areas of science, is that automation tends to displace rather than replace tacit knowledge. And so over and over again, what we see is that when you automate a process, rather than the tacit knowledge being the manual skill of how to pipette well, then it becomes the tacit knowledge about for example, which well plates you can use with the robot so that it doesn't go bonkers or some things like this. So it's not that we don't reduce the human intervention or the human knowledge in the system. We just sort of substitute it out for other kinds of human knowledge and other kinds of errors. Now, one of the things that I think is um, maybe really worth thinking about in terms of mechanical objectivity and trusted data is where that tacit knowledge is displaced to. So, for example, in Emerald Cloud Labs, which is the parent private company of this um, you know, project that's being implemented at CMU, one of the things that I find quite interesting is that initially all of the staff that are, were actually working within the robotic lab setup carrying around the plates and test wells were basically biology undergrads, kind of entry level, level job for somebody who had some training in biology. But interestingly, the company found them to be too interventionist, trying to fix too many problems, and they wanted people who would behave more like the robots and ended up hiring former Amazon warehouse workers, basically saying like, I'll pay you double to, you know, instead of put product A in box B, put like test tube A in slot B. And so in this case, we have a displacement of the tacit knowledge that's being gained into a workforce that is kind of fundamentally a different one in that they're not exactly part of the same sort of system of scientific norms and socialization. And that to me is something interesting to think about in terms of how it's changing scientific work and trust, because the movement of this tacit knowledge around through automation means that it's being displaced into places where we don't know as much about what the norms are governing these kinds of work communities. And that I think is something really worth studying. I think we also another, have a, a question oh, about math proficiency uh, here. I just uh, wanted to ask it. <laughs> oh, okay, then go ahead. It's, <laughs> it's your role. Yeah, yeah, it's uh, so there is one comment about uh, I do worry about the level of knowledge of statistics among scientists, but also among meta scientists. Um, so you think that the level of mass among biologists is a serious barrier to progress? I have some things to say about this, but I don't want to be the talky talky head. So if anyone wants to go first, go for it. I can go first here. <laughs> I, I, I do a more math oriented theoretical work myself. So um, I don't know like to what extent um, it's a generalizable problem. It is a problem in, in some kinds of meta science for sure. Um, it is a problem when um, quantitative evidence or quantitative claims are presented to researchers uh, to follow certain um, statistical procedures, for example, and, and when people who are presenting these procedures are not doing it either a good job or uh, maybe dumbing it down, assuming that the audience will not get it, so you lose a lot of nuance and a lot of uh, also precision in terms of uh, the claims themselves. So. We, we did, you know, like in, in 2021, we published a paper on that uh, um, case for scientific reform in um, case for formal methodology in scientific um, reform. And that was basically the focus because there are uh, a lot of the initial, I think, reform initiatives addressed quantitative research and how data was analyzed, you know, p-hacking and everything. And a lot of that is, yeah, on point, but some of the recommendations were not they were kind of um, being a little bit over eager to, again, instigate action. Um, some of the edges were kind of rounded um, to, to, to make some conclusions seem a little bit more appealing to the audiences. But I think uh, we need rigor in statistics as well, and we need to understand it to be able to give people recommendations as to how to use it. And that was kind of the the point in my um, 
priorities of science reform versus what was deprioritized part was about that. Like some of the things that got deprioritized was the, in the, the essence of scientific practice, you know, like what are our samples like? Um, what kind of models are we assuming? Are these models, you know, like uh, do we satisfy the um, assumptions of these models? And even, you know, like a, in a lot of these multi-site replication studies, the experimental design is never formalized. So you try to figure out what the model is to put it in a, a mathematical form, and it's sometimes impossible to gain that from the details of the experiment. So yeah, I think there's some some missing sophistication in that regard. Maybe it's on purpose that, you know, like assuming that the audience does not have the same sophistication, so we need to make things simple. Maybe it's just lacking. I don't know. I don't have evidence in either way. So I'll say my view on this is there is certainly a role for education and there are certainly people who are misusing statistics, right? Like those things are real and true things about the world. At the same time, I worry that there's a bit of a deficit model assumption underlying this question that basically the only reason that people use statistics differently than you might use them is because they are lacking the knowledge. And if we just fill them up with knowledge, then they will behave in the same way that you would want them to behave. And I think that that sort of undersells the problem, um, both because we have lots of evidence that that kind of deficit model thing doesn't work in practice, but also because it doesn't acknowledge other things that might be contributing to people's usage of statistics. So for example, this little chat that um, Bart and uh, Tim and I were having in, you know, sidebar in the, the chat here about the extent to which different disciplines think of things in terms of presence absence. This is one of those, I think, underlying assumptions where it's the assumption and not the knowledge of statistics necessarily that's the problem. So if you assume basically when you're studying a developmental system that if you knock out a gene, it's gonna result in a presence absence phenotype, it has it or it doesn't, that fundamentally changes the way that you analyze the system than if you consider it to be something that's gonna be drawn from a distribution. That may be an assumption which is better in some cases than others. And a thing that I think happens a lot, and this is something that, um, some, you know, uh, biologists have wanted to talk about to me almost in a guilty way, is that they may have started their careers studying phenotypes that really were better understood as binary presence absence phenotypes. But as they moved on towards studying more and more complex phenomena, it would have been more appropriate for them to switch over to thinking of something as, um, you know, drawn from a, a distribution of phenotypes, but they never really made that transition. And so in that case, maybe the problem is partially knowledge. You know, they didn't have the statistical skills because they didn't need them initially, but it's also partially about unseating that assumption that they have to approach their thinking about the data in a different way because they were using a, th a frame of thinking that was appropriate for one question, but now not appropriate for another. And oh. yes, Thomas, your microphone. I was going to ask a completely different question to Nicole, but if anyone wants to pop in about that previous one, please do so first. Okay, but if not, um, so I, my question for Nicole is about the the platforms, right, that um, researchers are using. And you talked a lot about um, how, you know, they become, they homogenize the, the methods that, that certain disciplines use. Um, I was going to ask if any of your research is also on like how those platforms grow and survive and what the implications of that, the sort of platform capitalism sort of area. Um, so obviously a lot of them are not capitalist products designed to make money but the bigger they get the more resources the more people use them the more resources that are needed to sustain them and you know eventually that there was some chat before um where people were sort of talking about um sort of ties into burner stuff about incentives to prove that meta science is working uh, you know does it sort of get to a point where a platform becomes so big and so well used that you know, it, it kind of needs to keep being used um, and promoted just to sustain like so many people's jobs. And, uh, you know, is there kind of incentives there that um, are problematic? 
Yeah, interesting questions. And I would be interested to hear, you know, other people's experiences with kind of platforms that are relevant for their areas of study too. But what I will say, you know, based on my sort of background studying this model organism approach in community and some of the stuff that I'm doing now on automated labs, it is absolutely the case that we see instances in which technologies become too big to fail not in my mind as much for the economic reasons, although they certainly are there, but because of the sort of continuity of data uh, lock-in effect problems, where essentially that if you switch to a platform which is too different, then it becomes really difficult to draw a line between existing bodies of research and new bodies of research. So when I was speaking before about some of the people who describe themselves as Illumina shops, basically, one of their motivations for not wanting to change was not just the startup costs of tacit knowledge, but also the fact that they had samples that they'd analyzed over a period of decades that they wanted to be in as much sense as possible consistently analyzed so that they could go back and compare these sort of sequential analyses over time. So I think it's not just economic self-interest which might generate these sort of effects where we lock into a particular platform. It's also this general desire for intraoperability <laughs> that I think maybe a lot of what we think about as kind of truth in science is actually really more so intraoperability. Like, can other people work with this result? Can other people get this result? Almost like, you know, can I plug my USB-C thing in when I travel in Europe type thing. And those intraoperability things, if we think of um, science problems in that way, we start to see them as these problems that are really analogous to an, a lot of other standard setters in the world. Um, so that, that's how I would view it. Maybe if I, just because I have the hand up, if I'm, I'm just on, on the same point, but on a much smaller scale, um, I thought of that when before we came to this um why why is variation and not necessarily um factored in but just like absent presence in phenotypes and all that it's literally also not just to make like science work on a larger scale but literally just your own experiment like you need to generate you when you work especially now i'm thinking of biology living systems you all you do is stabilizing what is not stable. You're trying to create some sort of stability that you have from time A, where you start your experiment, you still have the same thing at time B, because otherwise you can't say anything. You don't have the continuity. You, you need to make reliable claims even within your own experiment. So you're constantly, you're constantly trying to create and maintain something that's maybe not, it's, you know, it's, it's real state. You are distorting in order to enable certain forms of, of knowledge generation. And that happens even at the smallest level um even if there's no commercial interest it's just kind of inherent to what you need to eliminate variation and so on so it's just you can't get past some things but like with the platforms just to come back to that point as well um i think and, and this is nicole will have you know you will have a lot more direct insight into that but i'm just it's not even i'm not sure whether cloud lab for instance is the right site no it's it's one interesting site and one relevant site but then there are a lot of, it's maybe the cloud itself, not the cloud lab, like, you know, regular laboratories where a lot of work is now fed through the cloud and where certain automated systems are, are fed through specific cloud-based systems that creates new platforms and monopolies that are hard to break and that are obviously in, in, integrated with commercial interests as well. And kind of, you know, you see collaborations already with like, Gilson pipettes, they have a cloud-based, you know, certain automation help, but they actually have a, have a deal with Quiagen, you know, with the kits. So you automatically get those protocols uploaded onto your Gilson pipette, pipette man, whatever they call it, like your, um, your apps that you can use and so on. So there's like the way diversity of experimental practices is reshaped happens in the very micro space within each laboratory maybe and um, that's just something to look at as well I think it's interesting thoughts and I think I you know I might reframe slightly the idea of it happening within micro spaces because your comments really nicely point out how capitalism capitalism not just platform capitalism as Thomas was pointing to really impacts the way that um, standards proliferate in that it's not just certainly open science and meta science um, advocates who are doing things that encourage homogeneity right obviously corporations instrument manufacturers are also trying to encourage homogeneity 
where homogeneity is everyone uses their product. Uh, and so I want to you know, be clear that we should put those kinds of forces alongside other things like reforms that are you know, probably not even as potent as some of these other forces, like, okay, if you buy our Kyogen kit, you get a suite of tools that become easy for you to use such that you become a Kyogen shop. Like that's a, that's a real phenomenon as well. Yeah, we, we also have a question in the chat that is related to this. It's kind of like the question of uh, whether interoperability will degrade interdisciplinarity into a mapping of meta standards. Are the participants actually able to speak or is that a limitation of the platform? I would love to hear from Alexander more about what he means on that so that we could add his voice into the discussion. I don't know if that's a thing. Yeah, that, that's a limitation of the platform. It's only they can only comment. Does anyone have any thoughts on this or? Um, well, maybe I'll, I'll I'll kick it off, but I would love to hear more people chime in in terms of what they, they think this means. I, I think that, you know, if we were to draw an analogy from um, thinking about the tech world, I think one of the things that is more obvious in the tech world is that um, nature is not going to enforce a standard for you, that there are many potential ways to design a technology and there needs to be some human intervention on deciding what the standard actually is. Whereas maybe one of the ways that we could think about the reproducibility crisis is an assumption that the combination of the constraints of nature plus the constraints of, you know, statistical methodology were supposed to keep us, you know, sort of bound enough that there wouldn't be so much variation. And now what we see is that that's really not the case, that both nature and stats are malleable enough that we can get a number of different answers. And so it becomes more appropriate then to think about it in this way that it's like, all right, of the many human standards that we've developed for bringing a phenomenon into being, which one do we choose? Um, as to whether or not this will turn into a standard or many standards, I sincerely hope it won't turn into a standard. I mean, the point of my talk today was to try and argue against that world. I think sometimes it can be hard to defend heterogeneity because heterogeneity feels like messiness. It feels like everybody doing their own selfish, weird little thing. Um, but there are real benefits actually to accidental heterogeneity. That isn't to say that we couldn't manage heterogeneity by deliberately including it in projects, but that will always be limited to our assumptions about what variables we should be changing. And part of the value of unmanaged heterogeneity is it allows for a bunch of circumstances to kick up variation that we might not otherwise see because we hadn't thought to look there. So um, I would really like to argue for some lack of standardization and not just deliberate heterogenization because I think that the unmanaged heterogeneity plays an important role in science. Yeah, that, that really ties into sort of m many discussions about uh, researcher degrees of freedom, uh, which is sort of the designated label in meta science, uh, where other um, reflective disciplines use actually quite different labels, um, such as professional um, maneuverable spaces, or just essentially just judgment. Um, and um, I would say that when you close down every route towards uh, or, or shut down every researcher degree of freedom, you are deleting potentially valuable heterogeneity from the system, from emerging. Um, and in that sense, limiting, yes, um, but removing, no. I think uh, another interesting question we have that touches on at least three of the presentations we had is, uh, in my experience of 12 years, the tasks required for open science are much more than 20 to 30 minutes per administrative intervention. I estimate it adds days, if not weeks, to certain projects. Why do I accept that burden? Because it raises my own confidence in my findings and my persuasive powers. Thoughts? Can I just feels like a Thomas question? Oh, good, good. No, I, I just wanted to say I think that um, a lot of practices do add t 
time. But, and this goes back to a comment I made in the chat earlier. Um, I also think that we need to reframe the issue such that we're talking about the distribution of time spent, the distribution of labor. So for example, with registered reports, yes, it feels like they take heaps more time. But I think if you end up spending time on a really good pre-registration, getting it methodologically reviewed, then collecting your data and getting your, your in principle acceptance and collecting your data, you spend so much less time later on trying to get it accepted at a journal and have all these reviewers, you know, saying, oh, you should add this analysis, collect this more data, do this other different thing than you did. I think you decrease the possibility of more labor later on with, with some of these practices. So I think, yes, there is sometimes this extra labor feeling, but I don't think that has to be the case. And I think if we reframe the discussion about where the labor actually takes place and how you distribute that labor over the research uh, life cycle, I think there's a, a good argument for a lot of these things, not necessarily taking more time, but taking more time up front. Yes, Nicole, I think you also want to say something. No, I was just going to encourage Thomas to add in his two senses. This seems so relevant to his, his presentation. Oh, okay. Then, uh, Thomas, you would, like, would you like to add something? Um, yeah, I mean, I, I definitely think, you, you know, as as much as I've sort of said, like, oh, we need to think about the costs of, uh, the time costs of open research, like, you know, I, I do prescribe to the benefits of it. And having just done a registered report myself, actually, I think, yeah, the the process of 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 doing that did create a better outcome than if I had just done it a normal you know um standard sort of um piece of research um I do think that the the costs part of what it comes down to is that when I was saying about the the kind of the workload and the expectations of researchers is if we are and this speaks to broader things like incentives is that if we're still assessed on the number of publications rather than the quality of them, then anything that takes longer, if, if we've only got a limited amount of time to do research, then if it takes longer, then we are going to get fewer publications out of that time that we have available. Um, so definitely, you know, the shift to trying to evaluate research based on quality over quantity um, is a big thing. One thing I'm sort of unsure about, though, is that whether quantity in the end, when you're trying to assess researchers, is always going to come out as the ultimate thing that is assessed on, right? Because at the moment, you might say, oh, well, one really quality pre-register and, and this is particularly like if we use like Berner was saying kind of use things like pre-registration as like a heuristic for quality because then you're looking at the researchers outputs and you say oh well you know they've got two publications which are fully open pre-registered open data open materials uh, and that's like better than this other researchers five completely closed non-open uh, outputs but then there's another person who has five pre-registered open, you know, top quality papers. Like they've got more than that other person, the person with two. So you kind of, I, I don't know how the quality, you know, quantity of quality still ends up trumping quality. And I'm kind of unsure how we get out of that um, kind of rat race, really. Yep. Thank you. I think we have to come to a close already over time. I just would like to uh, tell everyone that this event uh, will be put on YouTube. So if you want to revisit it or share it with anyone, it will be openly available. And before we end, I also would like to thank everyone for attending and participating. I would like to thank the Center for uh, of Open Science for providing the platform for this really interesting event. And I would also especially like to thank our six presenters who made the event possible in the first place.